All right, here we go. Mayonnaise will never bite. Episode three. Ivan Munyang Gengo. Hey everybody, welcome to episode three of Mayonnaise on Every Bite. Thank you for watching, thank you for clicking on the link, thank you for being here and giving us your time. Uh, I want to do a little bit of an intro here and let you know a couple things. This this one's a little bit, this conversation's a little bit different with, uh, it's with my colleague and friend Ivan Munyengengo. And uh, he's not actually an athlete, a cyclist, but he does ride. He's more of an athlete, but he's a fitness professional. He owns a gym. He has a really interesting story. Colleague of mine in many ways, many senses. And uh, we didn't actually get to, <laughs> we didn't actually get to half of what we wanted to talk about. Um, and so we're probably going to do a follow up. There's a lot of subjects. There's a lot of um, things that have happened in the world and in Rwanda. Uh, recently in the past year, COVID, lockdowns, um, policies, and all kinds of things. Anyways, I'm not going to get into it here, obviously. We're going to wait for him and uh, and sit down and do it properly. But I also wanted to let you know that we, um, we, we understand that a lot of you don't really have time to watch this show in its entirety. You're not, you're not taking in the full content. You're not really, um, I don't know, I guess you're all busy or um, these people aren't interesting to you. What's the deal? Anyways, I'm doing my best to, to bring you, uh, to bring you a show that uh, let, allows you to know people that you might be uh, aware of to really get to know the community and the individuals out here in Rwanda, riding bikes, racing, the cycling community. And um, I would also really like to take this show on the road. I would like to upgrade a few things, maybe have a mic stand that's not held together by duct tape. Um, maybe bring this to you in HD. We're using some uh, some pretty uh, funky camcorders to, to do this because we're on a budget, man. Balling on a budget here. So we set up a Patreon account. I'm gonna put the links in uh, the link in the description. Uh, it is patreoncom slash Volsavant. V O L S A V A N T. That's me, Volsavant. Um, we're gonna yeah, we're gonna do the clips. We're gonna start clipping parts of the conversations so that um, you can take this. You can take uh, you you can get the bits and pieces of the of the conversation that might be uh, more interesting to you, without watching the whole hour and a half because most of these are hour and a half or maybe some of them will be longer. But uh, an hour and a half is good because that is one all tradian cycle. You know what that is? Anyways, thank you for watching. Enjoy this conversation with uh, Mr. Munyangango. Um, he, he's an interesting cat. And hopefully he'll be back and see you next time. Thank you for your attention. For Thank you for watching. Well, am I saying that right? No. Okay, wait, wait. Let me try again. Let me try again. <laughs> Ivan Munyengengo. Well, the A's are ah. Ah. So don't try to make them nge or it's nga. Munyenga. Ngo. Yeah. Nga. Ngo. Yeah. Nga. Ngo. Munyengango. Munyengango. Okay, bro. So. I got uh, my first question before we get into uh, telling people who you are mm -hmm. is uh, normally like I didn't actually know your full name until recently until yeah. we talked the other day like last yeah. week uh, you abbreviate your name normally you change the the I the Y to an I mm -hmm. and uh, so you just write your name as Ivan Munye mm -hmm. so why do you why do I do that? Why do you abbreviate it? You think it's, Why not? it's too much? Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> sure so, name. well, yeah, there is a history. Then there is a reason to that. And um, it pff, part of it is because people just insist to call me Ivan. And then... Um, is that the way, If with the Y, is it still pronounced the same? Is it Ivan or is it Ivan? Okay, Ivan is what sweet uh, Danish people call me. Mm. But it's actually Ivan. Yvon. Yeah, so, so it's like a period at the end. Yvon. En français. En français. And then, um, yeah, Anglophone people here 
call me Ivan. You drop like a bank slip somewhere and then somebody's going to pick it up at the bank and you're like, Ivan, <laughs> and no matter how it's written, they will still read it, Ivan. But it doesn't offend me. My teachers right. always called me Ivan or something. It's funny. And how then um, um, in, in Denmark, people have um, what could be close to, to, they have Ivan. Right. Yeah. So it's a common name up there. Yeah. But it's uh it's funny how um in Rwanda most pronunciations are not necessarily French but they they kind of go towards a French like when you pronounce things in Kinyarwanda. Mm-hmm. It's more it's more of a, a French bent towards the way you pronounce to things. Even though we're an anglophone country now. Yeah, but then uh, but that differ person to person. If you have if you have like a francophone background then yes. Uh, even right. your references, even the way you, yeah, right. No, but even like little things like um, esprit. Mm, okay, courage. Mm-hmm. When you're running, exactly, yeah, courage, yeah. esprit. Yeah. And like you know, it took me years to figure out what what the fuck esprit was. <laughs> I saw it written somewhere. I'm just like, oh, esprit. Get the spirit. Yeah, the spirit. But it's yeah. evolved to just be esprit, 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 esprit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. like. Isn't isn't it nice that people actually cheer on each other on the road when they're doing something like esprit? That, it's, it's it's in uh, it's in the in the culture. Culture. That's yeah. actually one of the nicer things. I hear a lot of things that I'd rather not hear mm-hmm. when, <laughs> <laughs> when I'm out on the road. But that's one of the cool things is that when people see you out doing sport, esprit, yeah. esprit, esprit. That's pretty dope. Yeah. Right. So uh, you know, let, let's let's take care of some uh, some background here. Um, I'll just call you Ivan for now. Mm-hmm. That's how I know. Yep. You. But uh, you're born in Kigali. Born in Kigali. Medium sized family. Mm-hmm. Four siblings. Four siblings. Which number are you? I'm third. You're third. Yeah. So you're not the runt, but you're. No, not yeah. <laughs> two boys, two girls. And uh, who's the oldest? Is it the oldest a girl or it's boy? It's a girl. A girl. Two big girls, two young boys. Oh, so they came in sets. Yeah. Interesting. Yep. So without going too deep into it, um I forgot I forgot exactly how old you are now. You're thirty three. Thirty three. Thirty three. Thirty four in July. Right. So obviously you lived through ninety four. Mm-hmm. And um your family was from near Bumba or just went up there during that period? Went there during that period. Went there during we, that we, period. Yeah. You lost both your parents. Uh-huh. And, um, but your life continued until now. Yeah. Francophone school after, uh, you graduate, you finish secondary school, AKA high school for our American (laughs) listeners. (laughs) Francophone. Yeah. Francophone. Yeah. yeah. Which, I mean, we're going to get through, we're going to get through your details, but I have another question about that. I was just like, Francophone school. I've never heard you speak French. I've never heard you say anything in French, and yeah. you don't have any kind of francophone accent. I'm, 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 are you still fluent in French? Did you ever? It's, it's the language I think in. I mean, Kinyarwanda is my mother tongue, obviously. Right. But when it comes to, if I want to work on anything that requires um, uh, to use, like if I want to be articulate, articulate uh-huh. in a foreign language, I will use French and then translate it into English. So it goes. Can you want to French, English, yeah. the hierarchy of what you're most comfortable using? Yep. Hmm. Yeah, bro. I, You know, I heard someone say once, and I thought it was really, really accurate, even though I don't really speak a second language mm-hmm. well at all, let alone fluently. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but that you don't really understand a language until you speak a second one. Yeah. I don't know why. Yeah. Why? Explain. Well, I think that the I think that uh, the logic behind that is that you know you just it's I think it's sort of a nod towards you know the new, new, the neutrality principle where whatever you grow up with, whatever you're used to, you kind of have a sense of it being normal. Yeah. Right. So if you only speak one language, like most Americans do, guilty. Uh, that's just how you, you the language. Is, you think in um, everyone, everyone's brain is different, but most people you have a language to describe the world to themselves and to others. That's how we communicate, and that's how we, you know, all our dreams, our thoughts, everything is 
in a language. Yeah. So it's difficult to see outside. It's difficult. You can't get out of it to see see it from another perspective. But when you learn another language, like okay, let's. I relate to it in this sense where like I'm not I, I'm not even conversational in French, but I understand a lot of it. Mm-hmm. I've been around a lot of French speaking people. Most races is the races yeah, yeah. the race radios in French. The meetings will be in French. Yeah, yeah. They'll translate and cycling it. has. Uh, I mean, it's like French is the. Yeah, every lingo, every yeah. I've lived in Europe. Uh, my first girlfriend was Quebecois, so I was around her French family. Very different French. Yeah, but basically, I have enough, enough knowledge and enough uh, sort of. I'm tuned in enough to French that it's like, I can see the similarities. I can see kind of the evolution of English. Yeah, how different things are expressed, and it just gives you a context. And the same with Kinyarwanda. I don't know much at all, but I understand. Quite a lot, yeah. Quite a lot, and I can express myself briefly, mostly with the kids in uh, very informal ways. But even that gives me a sense of how, really how strange English is. Mm, What do you call it strange? Strange in how, how it's structured. It's like we have, like, the rules, the rules of of English are not always... um, They don't always make sense, right? Mm-hmm. Like the way we the way we s- decide how the plural of something is pronounced in this category or for this thing mm-hmm. versus this thing, or you know, we have different spellings of words that, that sound the same. Yeah, you know what I mean. There's a right way and a wrong way. It's really it's really yeah. it's really detailed and complex, and it's like there's all these rules that are kind of unnecessary. But then when you get into the bigger words, you know. Anyways, it just gets pretty technical, and it's like basically from the outside, be like English is pretty confusing if you didn't grow up speaking it. It can be, yeah, but again, it's one of the easiest languages to learn. Is it? Yeah. Well, it doesn't doesn't hurt that it's so widespread. <laughs> but anyways, before we spend uh, too long mm-hmm. just talking about language, which language. is which is, la- I mean, language is huge, but language is a really interesting topic. Yeah. Um, cool tool. But to sort of close the loop on your history, you finished you finish secondary school and then you were sent, you, your what, first. What, what, what is, uh, uh, what, what, uh huh? When you finished school, mm-hmm. you basically went to work for your uncle. Your well, uh, no, there's a lot of things that happened there. So, um, I, yeah, like the year. So there's the high school, there's the waiting year of um, where you get a scholarship. Mm-hmm. And then... Um, after you finish high school. After you finish high school. Well, not everybody gets a scholarship. Were you part of a program? Not everybody, yeah. I mean, if my brain is called a program, yeah. <laughs> what, what do you mean? <laughs> I was by, part of wait, what do you mean by a scholarship? A scholarship in, my, in, in the Western uh, sense is like basically someone's going to give you money to go to school. They're going to pay for you to go to school. That's what a scholarship is. Yeah. But there's a different, there's, it has another sort of meaning in the francophone. Like a scholarship is like a placement almost. No, I mean here, every at the end of every, um, I don't know if there's any scholarships at the primary to secondary schools. I don't know. But secondary to uni, to to. Um, <laughs> advanced institutions um there there were there are scholarships there is an exam there's a national exam to pass right you and qualify if, you, get the, if mm-hmm. you qualify if you get the yeah right marks then um you get whatever that is available for each category kind so of so you basically applied for scholarship you don't apply actually it's kind of automatic depending on your marks on on how you rank on the nas- with that national exam They have a version of like the SATs here. Yeah, it's it's pretty much like that. So now at time it was, um, there was eleven um, points to grab, and uh, yeah, basically you would get like I don't know, I got nine point five, and that technically allows you to go to any university. So you yeah. scored high, so you had your pick of schools. Yeah, but you didn't go to university. I did go to Kist. Okay, for how and long though? For like a year and a half, okay. or two years. But you didn't. It wasn't. You didn't finish. It wasn't your. It wasn't your jam. It wasn't my jam. I mean, by the way, I mean this is. Is this something I'm? Um, okay, 
it's funny yeah now i'm talking about yeah so it's um it's um <laughs> maybe i should be a proud drop bro i dropped out man i went to two <laughs> semesters i studied fashion design maybe I, sh I should be a proud pro about i studied fashion design for two semesters and i was like you know what i actually mm -hmm. don't want to make clothes fuck this i'm gonna move to los angeles i was going to school in san francisco yeah and it was like it was just one of those things where i had this idea going in and then after i just realized how I, it wasn't what I it wasn't what I needed to do at all. Yeah, but I learned. I mean, I learned a lot from the experience, but I didn't learn how to make clothes. Yeah, so I don't wouldn't say it was wasted time, but I don't know if I'd be any better off if I had a degree in fashion design. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Here, like it's um, you know, um, the, the, the funny story is that um, there was um, the government was putting a lot of effort in. Um, science and technology and they provided a lot of scholarships for that discipline right and um it was like hot hot everybody was wanted to do anything that has something to do with sciences especially computer it was competitive then yeah then um um yeah it's like my generation we all kind of did the same shit and whether you believed in it not um, or not, but uh, you just wanted to like advance forward. It was like a trend. Yeah, it was what was like. Um, okay, the next generation needs to be really tech fluent. We're all going to study this. Kind of, yeah. yeah. So there was yeah a bunch of um, uh, people that were supposed to be like yoga instructors and <laughs> that were thrown in that basket. A bunch of people that were supposed to be neuroscientists, let's say, or a bunch of people that were supposed to be doing art stuff. And it wasn't right for everybody. It wasn't. So yeah, at Keist, I remember. I mean, I hated every. Um, I'm not good with attendance of anything, a conference and meeting, uh, like just sitting Structure. and a structured yeah. uh, form of absorbing information so i have my alternative ways of um, educating myself and i've always uh, found a way to get what uh, the school wanted me to deliver on paper without using the, the structured ways because it was a bit um, the conformity requires to sort of um, meet the demand i mean i remember one of my problems at KIST was the attendance they were really really hard on it um, to a point where like if you even have even if you're like I don't know how smart you can be but if you didn't sit in a class it was very important to meet a certain right percentage of attendance so it's no matter 60 percent if I remember well no matter how well you did on the test if you weren't you sitting in class pass. right yeah so it's but an, then, uh, that's an interesting thing I've heard do you know who Malcolm Gladwell is no who's that? he's an author uh, one of my favorite authors but he tells a story about his youth where him and his friend they had this competition mm -hmm. Uh, where they they competed. They were both trying to get the highest GPA, which is marks. They yeah. were going to school in Canada. I'm yeah. not sure where in Canada. But basically, they had this competition who could get the highest mark with the least, the lowest attendance. Yeah. And their parents were very hand, hands off with their um, with their parenting, so they weren't busting their, busting their balls for not going to school. Yeah. So he basically says, we almost never went to school. But it was sort of this competition between us who could get the highest GPA without actually going to school very much. Yeah. And they're both massively intelligent people, so they had yeah. no problem, you know, yeah. testing high in the you know, or or scoring high in the tests and uh and doing all that stuff. But like this kinda that's kinda what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. You're basically like you could ace the test, but, but you without, didn't need to be yeah, yeah. you didn't need to sit in class that yeah. long. But I mean I mean, I have a lot to say about that. And then that. later on, I mean, you know when you're a kid and you're you hate that kind of structured environment. And well, some yeah, people like running it. And some people, some people like, like it. it. Yeah, like firstborns and sometimes they like it. Yeah. Sometimes some people <laughs> are just good at like, okay, this is the curriculum, this is the system, and these are the steps. And then I'm gonna do that. Just yeah. check them off yeah, the yeah. list. Some so, people are good at that. Yeah. So then, uh, yeah, try to find to put some guy with uh, all kinds of personality traits that I possess. I'm not agreeable necessarily. Yeah, depends. And um, well, you have you have to be low in agreeableness to to make much change. I mean, that's one of the big five personality traits that they measure is agreeableness. Cool. So yeah, then so, as a kid, uh, you you have that, and then uh, then you have now what after growing, you realize that it's actually a serious mental health issue. What uh, is? Well, when you're not 
when you don't like structure, when you are oh, uh, a right. kid that moves around, and right. uh, it's it's a mental health issue. When you in have a, a problem with, in the sense of, I mean, if you have a very low uh, attention capacity, basically, I couldn't focus on things. Well, I wouldn't say you don't you don't come across to me as someone that has like ADD, for example. Mm-hmm. For I, me, there was also the hyperactivity. Was so, there? Yeah. Okay, you hide it I, well. I could, I'd, yeah, like I would be. Eh? <laughs> you hide it well. I was like this. Well, for yeah. me, for me, I don't have ADD, but structure is near impossible for me. I really have to try at it, even as an adult, because I'm dyslexic. Yeah. But I was homeschooled, so I never, I was never faced with this problem. Mm-hmm. You know, I was allowed my all my academic work was a huge struggle for me. Yeah. But I was allowed to do it on my own time. Yeah. In my own way. Yeah. And I, I had ways of getting through it. You know, I made lots of spelling mistakes, still do to this day. Yeah. You know, I was okay enough in math to get a high school diploma yeah. and pass the test for the, the state. But yeah. I mean, I don't know if have you ever been tested for ADD? Like No, I mean I've done all these um well with my psychologist we've done this these tests basically on on yeah. It's not like um Basically, when you look at all symptoms, I had them, mm-hmm. and I still do. And um, um, I think I've, with, I self-tested myself with this yeah. online test, with this thing. I don't know how accurate they are with these questions. But when you are self-aware, the way I am, I feel uh, that um, I shouldn't miss a, a diagnosis like that. I, I, I feel like I'm quite certain that I, yeah. Have. I'm the same way with my dyslex- dyslexia. No one told me that I was dyslexic as a kid. It wasn't until I really started to, you know, delve into consuming science as an adult that I realized I was textbook dyslexic. Yeah. And that allows me to sort of understand myself better and use tools to yeah, figure things out. You know, I mean, it's not it's not it's not a negative thing if you figure out what your particular I mean, I don't even wouldn't even call it a disability cuz like for me just It's not. I mean, in most cases it's not actually. Yeah, it, it can depends. be. It depends. If you are boxed, if you are asked to actually confirm and be like uh, any other person. I mean, if you are in right. an environment that then you suffer. That wants to yeah, in an in an, uh, in an environment that wants you to ask you to be like others, then you suffer. But if you are a very early age, if you are spotted by somebody and then you get help and then you actually can get, um, like, yeah, for example, there's this Canadian doctor that I like. Um, he talks a lot about his ADHD himself and he published a lot on it and um, he focuses on the positive uh, part of it, like the importance of having it. The ability the aspect. Ab- yeah. Right. And, and he, I mean itself as a disorder and whatever all those negative words that come with with, with it as a sickness i he heard i heard focus. someone once call adha uh, which is atten- or ada attention deficit advantage advantage yeah yeah, yeah that's pretty cool exactly. because the, i mean he says he talks about it that uh, people with adhd they that they have ferrari brains with bicycle brakes basically so something like that yeah basically yeah, um, yeah. That, I mean, the way to absorb information in the most unusual ways and the the the, the, the computing power. The I mean, uh, eventually, of course, you get to be to be able to relax. But when you're actually running information computing, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, you you got a good brain for that for multitasking. You just for, have to learn how to channel your particular how to channel computer. all that energy yeah. and then uh, put uh, put it to good use. Right, you got so it. that you're not uh, self no sabotaging. Yeah. Well, <coughs> I feel like we're getting pretty deep into this without telling people what you do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm gonna. If I had to tell somebody what you do, I would mm-hmm. say that you're. I would say loosely that you're a fitness professional. Uh-huh. Right, because you're a personal trainer, but that's a pretty small box. Yeah. Right. You can be a personal trainer and be pretty limited. Yeah. But you, you, you do train people. You are um, a student of fitness, of diet, of mm-hmm. psychology. Mm-hmm. Um, you're an intellectual. You own a gym. Um, but basically, fitness is your racket, and that's yeah. where and that's where you and I sort of cross. That's how yeah. we, that's how we ended up meeting. You know, s- gym work, strength training, conditioning, and all that kind of stuff is sort of um, the the common the playground. The common yeah. thread that that uh, allowed our paths to cross. 
Should we go through the rest of your history briefly? Well, is this going to be all about me? Yeah, yeah, bro. I mean, people, gonna un- how much shit are you going to uncover today? Uh, no, we're not going to uncover everything. We're just going to do the basics. But I, no. what I do want to touch on is, so after this, what is it called? Kisk, the university you went to? Mm-hmm. Kigan Institute of Science and Technology. Right. Kisk. So so after you did your stint there, at some point, are we at the point now where you go to Kenya? Mm. Right. So your uncle basically recruits you to go and represent him well yeah like i have this uncle that we not very close but um i mean he's still a person in my family so um he i was just this loose guy here without a job without any kind of obligation i mean uh responsibility so at this point you had stopped university uh, at that, yeah at that, right. at that point in time and then um what next um yeah i was i was um probably also many people wondering what to do with me kind of thing and uh were you a problem like, you were <laughs> you were a disenfranchised youth yep a so bo- a bomb waiting to go uh, off exactly what do so, we yeah. do with this kid i remember yeah i mean him talking to my sister they arranged to like I go help him with uh, whatever project he had he had some land and some but this is in, this is in kenya of. in uh it's not in Nairobi, it's in Eldoret. Eldoret. It's a little bit out. Right. And, um, yeah. But what I want well, what I want to tell people about what, what the history that I think is dope is the history of that place. Oh, Eldoret is cool. I mean, this place is, it has for, this. For people that don't th- know, this is the epicenter of endurance running. Yeah. This it's, is, this it, is the legendary Kenyan. The, yeah. Eton. They have this center. The Eton the Training Center. center. Yeah, yeah. Called Eton. Everybody, they have. Um, you just every, happened to be there. You, I happened to be there. Your your and uncle was had some business there. You go there to represent I, him. I go there to do stuff the with with yeah, and um, so you get exposed to this. I get exposed to these. It's like from one to like a hundred kind of uh, exposure to athleticism, and um, yeah, I mean I can't imagine people, another place in the world that's going to be more of a athletic culture than that. Yeah, and the whole community, the impact they have on the community is just crazy. Isn't okay. that cool? And that's that's something I wanted to ask you about. Yeah. I mean, go ahead. And yeah, and um, so it's basically, you, it's a city, you feel the, the, I mean, also the Kalenjin people, like which is the, the, like the tribe of um, the the Kenyan people living in uh, Eldoret. The, po- just, the population the, that's yeah, native yeah. to that it's area. It's like a very, like, yeah, proud people and, and awesome. They are they're known by their tenacity and the grit and the hard work and the relentless energy to just do stuff, life stuff. So if you channel all that. The culture there, the tradition. And you put it into running, and then you see why people actually running uh, run miles and miles unpaid with poor running shoes and yeah. poor nutrition and po- just, they just, just because it. they feel like they are going to train and one day there will be a shot and they are going to take right. it. Right, and it's 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 the biggest game in town. Yeah, yeah. Most of these kids that make it to the global scenes, uh, they don't come from a structured uh, athletic development. They, it's not like they were like detected through like a, a, a huge, a good, a, a structured program of talent detection. Yeah, yes, but maybe not because there's just, there's something in there that I I think is really important, mm-hmm. and it's really important to cycling. Yeah, which is obviously my game. Um, is that okay? It wasn't structured, mm-hmm. you know. There's no coaches like going out there testing people and like observing the talent. No, pool. there are. Like I'm just talking about itself. An area is is a big pool of talents. Yeah. So there is what you, I'm they getting. Can't cover it all. What I'm getting to is that there's there's what's you know there's an athleticism culture. There's a culture of running. Mm-hmm. So even if you're on the periphery, if you're on the outskirts of that, you're not yep. involved directly. Everything that's happening, you sort of absorb. Yeah, you're around it. Exactly. And even if you're not necessarily like an acute student of how to be a world class runner, yeah, you don't even really have to pay attention. But if you're near it, you will absorb things, yeah. values. Yeah, you'll absorb knowledge. You'll absorb how to run. And yeah. if you get involved, you don't necessarily need a textbook. I, what I'm trying to get to is like the, how important the culture is. It is yeah. And so the the phenomenon i think there beyond the the you know the biological talent that these people have 
yeah which is extraordinary and the culture you know the character of the 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 characters that the culture um sort of holds up and um and has to offer yeah. in the community but you have so many you have you have a critical mass of yeah. people that are doing this sport at a really high level yeah and what that does is that anybody that wants to get involved they're immediately exposed to a really nuanced complex deep pool of knowledge yeah and that just by being around it yeah and even then, if there's even if they're not one of the guys that the coach has selected to be the next prodigy or whatever right yeah. just being around it you learn so much yeah yeah exactly and this, yeah and this is a huge thing in cycling because so much you need so like running is a little less complex i think but i think it is complex also oh it is yeah definitely complex if you really think about it you realize yeah. how 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 important technique and pacing and yeah. like how deep you can go down the rabbit hole of yeah yeah the nuance of it but in particular in cycling because you're on this machine you have to learn these things and then you end up in a group you have all these sort of added dynamics yeah that um one of the critical things or I would say I would say almost the most critical thing, regardless of how much talent you have, yeah. is that you have the ability to be around a racing culture where you can learn those things by osmosis. Yeah. Where you can be exposed to professional riders, yeah. how to ride. And you just learn by observing by doing. It's sort of automatic. Yeah. But if that you know, if you take if you take a kid that's from Eldoret mm -hmm. and right, and you put him somewhere else, you say, Okay, you've got all the talent, learn how to run. Yeah. It's gonna be much more difficult could still do it yeah but it's going to be much more difficult in that in and that, that in an environment that, yeah that that that, that sporting culture when it's robust and it's holistic and it's sustainable yeah and it's something that's grounded in the community that kids can be exposed to yeah. and grow up around or in is huge i think that's really really important yeah and to me that's the magic of that place and that's the mad that's where the true magic lies in the phenomenon of the runners that come out of that area. Yep. So there you are. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. Did I you have Did you have any concept of time like? There. Uh -huh. Did you have any concept of like how cool it was to be around that, or was it just sort of like, oh, these guys? No, are I I knew. I mean, uh, before then, I really wasn't that exposed to running, and but um, um, again, it's just it's just amazing how um, uh, some of these decisions we take with with, with life they just follow naturally your right your, your, I mean, the, the, the idea of like me not liking a structured life and, and and the outdoors was kind of my area where i liked and i felt felt the best you basically felt, yeah you got, you got exposed to a form that yeah. worked for you yeah so i i i running is something that every time i put on a pair of sneakers and i hit the streets i just feel like this is where i have to be kind of thing right like it's one of those things you do and then you feel like you're doing things you're supposed to be doing. So I never really developed into a good runner or whatever. I have always been like an enthusiast, just following races here and there, being involved here if if if, if there is something happening. Yeah, we working have like with a different kind of, of marathon athletes. once a year, right? Yeah. So I've run a couple of half marathons. For example, the exposure from from that place mm -hmm. make made me really pick up running to a serious level where we were just doing things with with friends i had a group of friends we would register like two weeks to go and we would crash a half marathon and yeah well, just yeah anything you can apply yourself to and dig into and be like okay i'm gonna do this i'm gonna train i'm gonna get yeah. better i'm gonna yeah. comp i'm gonna compete against who i was yesterday exactly or last so, week or last month that's that's a that's a big yeah. thing. i think for people like you and me that's a huge part of who we are and what we need to do in life Mm -hmm. Like for me, like for me training, I still got my data, I got my training peaks, I'm on the software and I go out and I don't have a really structured training program, but I still do intervals and shit. Yeah. And it's like, well, what am I training for? I'm training for a race that's in my imagination. For your life. <laughs> that's two months away. <laughs> no, exactly. I, yeah. I, I actually, I actually picture racing, you know, yeah. even though I probably won't, Yeah. but I actually picture racing. So for you running and training, you're exposed to this racing culture. You can still sort of embody that yeah. and have this plan of like all right i'm gonna go out there i'm gonna hit the streets i'm gonna hit yeah. the pavement i'm gonna train i'm gonna do this and it's like you kind of sort of pull in all this energy yeah and embody it it's uh yeah but did you have any concept before you went of of 
the le- the the legend of the place, the legacy. Yeah, I mean the place in bars and I mean the photos you see, the frames, the like. So you, you knew have, you knew when you went where where you're going. No, I had no idea. It's all okay. It's that's what I was asking. Ah, okay, okay. No, no, no. <laughs> it's all the stuff I found when I when when I got there. Okay. So yeah, in bars, in places. I mean, there's also this building that owned by some legend there and yeah so you start hearing about the big names that were there that still uh, don't live um, in Eldoret anymore but who are probably in Nairobi or in the US or some other countries yeah and um, who are doing other things with life but who really have um, had an impact on the city and yeah. the people's minds and uh, have done huge for the sport yeah. heroes cultural heroes cultural heroes yeah yeah and 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 if you ask me like there were they have been uh, I th- i'm sure you you know about uh, people studying uh kenyans uh as as if it's like special species right they're like why are they crashing marathons why are they so good what are they? i don't twofold. think most of it huh it's twofold it's, it's many things it, it's <laughs> it, sure they're biologically it's so many suited things, to it yeah. but it's all it's the culture really the culture yeah. and the idea of ken you know when somebody has done something and then uh, the next generation believes that they can too. Exactly. That's you. Yeah. You plant that seed into any kid's head. Mm-hmm. Period. There you have a champion. I mean, beyond the physiology, the biology that needs to deliver all that, they have to be that. Uh, no, I know exactly. Idea what you of mean. belief. I got. I got this line in my yeah. book that, <laughs> if, that if you grew up, if you grow up believing that your parents could walk on water, yeah. Then you probably spend your entire life thinking or trying to walk on water. Trying to walk on water, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and probably eventually come up with some ways to Maybe. do it or to do something that's close to that. Right, yeah. right. So, it's um, what's in yeah, what's in those runners? Uh, what makes them really good runners is mostly the uh, idea of being able to do it. The, the exposure yeah. to the culture. This is how it's done. The example. Yeah. Yeah, we're incredible. Human beings are incredible learning machines. And when yeah. we, we're around something that's done well, we can embody it. I mean, just by being around that, yeah. you, you could become a phenomenal runner even not being well suited to it. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, the the, the humbleness. These people are just crazy good. I mean, you go to, to Eaton itself. I mean, it has like what? Like thousands of gold medals. <laughs> right yeah from the time it was it was established then you have all these athletes mm-hmm. who, who live there yeah be, come for training camps and yeah. some are like they have good mansions and big suvs in nairobi but they have to come there to train yeah Do where it. they actually get to wash their hair i mean they are millionaires in u.s dollars but they wash their hand i mean the, their clothes and they clean their toilets they, have, they cook their meals and they are the all work. all is part of the training the work ethic is important yeah absolutely so, yeah they're extremely grounded you you look at them you can't even note there are these people who are like working with like big management firms in new york right. i mean signing deals with the gq i mean he could fly directly from that camp in eton to the gq magazine cover right. basically and come back and again being that body of of a champion and yeah. what yeah. is the guy that broke the marathon to <laughs> Elliot Elliot Kipchoge he's, he's the, from there right yeah yeah so he he's probably one of the biggest mm-hmm. names he's I mean this guy is uh, f- but he's not young how old is he now Kipchoge is like 33 4 so he's, he's basically your age yeah he looks older which is right yeah. maybe it's because he's mean, so lean Yes, or maybe when you lose a lot of fat in your face, you look old. But also maybe because he's run so much. Like and, you know, and the, he's ha- the, the 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 most imp- impressive thing for 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 what he's doing um, for that guy that I love the most is is the longevity. We've seen this name for like what f- 10, 15 years now. I don't know. I confess, uh, I don't yeah, actually on the top of the little boy. This guy, yeah, he can, yeah, he he can. Right after, I mean, there are these legends like Kennedy Sabekele, the Ethiopian. Yeah. There, there, there are other big Kenyan names that were there before him. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, he's he came from track actually. He was doing what four hundred, eight hundred. He 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 transitioned to half marathon. He missed 
he didn't make it to the Kenyan team at some point. And he hadn't found his niche yet. Yeah, the, he was very successful on track. And then he transitioned. I don't know what happened. I don't remember the story very well. But then he transitioned to, to, to doing half marathons. Right. Then he, he was at some point, like, okay, 21 is not so, yeah. Then full marathons. It's a remarkable All story. The, yeah. And it's remark. I really love the the way that Ineos got involved and how how detailed they got. Even the yeah, drafting. The project. Yeah. yeah. Like the, I mean, I've heard some um, I've heard some scientists talk about the nutrition. They, they had everything planned, man. Yeah. I, they left no stone unturned, and that kind of, that level of an analysis and science, I think, is really yeah. interesting. And I actually heard through the grapevine that uh, Ineos was interested in African cycling and seeing what they could do. Um, and I've tried to follow it up, but I'm not. Yeah. Uh, maybe that's an idea that's not no longer alive, and that's an. That's well, they're definitely interested in endurance sports. I yeah, mean, heavily. I think I, mean, I think that there has to be something for them to invest in, and I think that African cycling is still such a vague, unknown uh, world. Yeah, you know, like everyone knows that Rwanda is doing well, and you know, okay, they're racing over here. The South yeah. Africans are pretty good, but no one. Yeah. There's no. There's no elder. There's no. There's, yeah there's there's not that f there's no clear place to go like okay this is where the good cyclists are yeah this is where the magic is yeah let's go there and turn this is and what makes them and yeah. create a tour de france champion like it's not clear cut like that. but what's the what's the problem i mean is it is it that it's so young the mm. culture here no um no, are, I, are we being? Are we have no. we had like tremendous achievement? I mean, really good, successful. What, what we're lacking riders, is and then they sort of set the bar so high, and then we 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 kind of are struggling, uh, keeping the momentum. No, the and then we are cycling. asking so much from very little to yeah. almost to no culture. Are we asking so much to this culture that is so young? It depends on who you ask. My my, I mean, the briefest version I can give you is that. Is that the people that run sport are don't understand it well and they're complacent. They, yeah. they don't understand where this success comes from, how we got to this level. Yeah. They really don't understand much about it at all. And even yeah. people that are involved in cycling, um, you know, their level of proficiency and um their concept of the nuance of the sport is is good enough to continue doing what we're doing. You know, a kid can be introduced to the sport and have an amazing life. Yeah. You know, basically have a full career and really go up a level in, in terms of finances or class or whatever. Yeah. Um, you know, if he comes from one of these poor backgrounds, which for some reason, literally all of our athletes do. Yeah. Um, but I think that what what we're missing in cycling mainly is infrastructure. But the key thing is that critical mass, mm -hmm. that culture. Yeah. And that has to that has to exist not only. Uh, in the community, mm -hmm. but at a racing level. Yeah. So I mean, for, for example, I was exposed to complex racing of many varieties: mountain biking, criteriums, road races, cyclocross. When I was very, very young. Yeah. And so I was training with professionals by the time I was fifteen. I was racing with regional and national level professionals by the time I was sixteen. Yeah. You know, starting races with a hundred guys. Yeah. Were you always with? those ambitions to want to make it yeah pro or yeah 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 or it just I was happened I, my, my my dad um my dad's friend tom ritchie of ritchie designs owned a company that built mountain bikes and uh -huh. components and stuff uh -huh. i'm not sure if you're familiar with ritchie yeah, I, mean, I think tom, you are. i know tom ritchie yeah. yeah so tom ritchie was like a family friend and stuff like that i grew up watching the tour de france yeah and it never occurred to me to be a professional cyclist but i always had a bike like riding was kind of part of our family mm -hmm. culture my dad now go for mountain bike rides with our friends and stuff like that yeah but he had a mountain bike racing team and for some reason when i saw the pictures of his team and i heard the stories like oh we got this guy who's gonna win the world cup and do it yeah. i was just like i have a mountain bike yeah there's professional mountain bikers i could do that so from the beginning as soon as i took it seriously i was yeah. training to be a professional to that be. was my goal yeah yeah okay cool and wow. i mean i was still a homeschooled kid i was living out in the country so it's like there weren't that many things for me to sort of gravitate to. Yeah. It wasn't like I had all these different sports, like, well, which sport do I want to play? It's like, there weren't like a lot of like, there wasn't like a whole buffet of options of like, you could do this, you yeah, could yeah. do that. It was just like, oh shit, there's this cycling thing, I could do that. I could do it. So I just, I dove, I dove straight in, man. I trained like a motherfucker. I trained way too much as a kid. 
Yeah. My, I mean, I didn't have much guidance. My dad didn't know that much about training or anything. I just figured the harder I work, the stronger I'll be. Yeah. I did some crazy stuff. I'm trying to put it in my book, but. Cool. So, <clears throat> it's gonna take us three hours to get through, get to the present day with your story here, bro. Uh, so now you're running, you have this experience. Mm -hmm. It lasts for a period, but um, if at some point you end up st kind of start going back and forth between Kigali and Eldred. And Eldred, and then at some point I just stopped and sank Kigali. Yeah. So, but the exposure was enough for me to actually uh, want to be an athlete, do something, be in fitness, be, yeah, be in the, in, the, in the field. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. So I took a certification course, and then I became a certified personal trainer. Yeah. And I started. I, I wonder if we took the same course. I took it in 2007. What was it called? It starts uh, with was, an N. There's some uh, uh, NSAS. There's a National. I think that's Sports what it Science is. Association. Yeah. What there's that, yeah, but there's also the AISSA, the International Sports Science Association. That's I don't what remember I which one I took, but it expires after two years, right? It does, but you have to if you're in the field and you have to keep renewing it, right? Yeah, updates, and, uh, yeah, updates, taking different courses. And, and I imagine yeah. you had to get like CPR, first aid certified. Yes, too, right? yes, yeah. I've done. Yeah, I mean, in 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 secondary school, there were actually these uh, Red Cross uh, mobilized groups yeah. of uh, first. Your first uh, responders. responders yeah i had my first responder i mean my uh, first aid certificate as a kid and then uh it was pretty much uh easy and to do it I, I you think knew I've what it was out, you yeah. know they update that stuff too though like they do even in different. europe when i was looking for a job at a gym um uh, i had to to do the test and uh yeah the more the, they learn the, about the new training the more they learn about physiology and the science, the more they, they every now, I think, I can't remember how they updated it, but it was different from when I, it's different now than from when I learned it. Yeah. I remember, I have a funny story. When I took my class, you know, did you have the dummies where you got to do the yeah, yeah, compression the CPR. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So everyone's got their <laughs> dummy, right? Everybody got their dummy, yeah. They got these freaking, this fleet of dummies, right? And bro, it clicks. Bro, these cables down here, Jesus. Oh, come on, bro. Okay. You going to unplug something? Is everything still working? Studio. That's what I mean. Let's make sure you didn't. Yeah, yeah, okay, we're still good. <laughs> so everyone's got their dummy, right? Yeah. And everyone's like... You, I mean, I, I don't think we had many dummies, but we, we, we definitely had one, and we, maybe we were taking turns. You had to share but one. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. But then, uh, yeah, it just puts... Um, but but anyway, let me tell you my... So the, the real question can be, like, did you actually ever get to do any resuscitation? Any, no, any, on any a human? Cardiac? No. Yeah. I've, but I've, I've done one. The dummy you had, when you pushed on it, did it click? Yeah, did it? I don't remember. No. So the ones we had, probably no. When you did it right, there'd be a yeah. little click. Oh, okay. Right. So I'm sitting there fucking wailing away <laughs> on my dummy, and it's not clicking. And my teacher's just like, "No, you got to push harder." Yeah. And click. I'm just like, "Yeah, yeah, bro, I'm pushing." <laughs> and he's like looking at me like I'm the dumbest motherfucker in the world. He's just Push, like pushing on. Finally, has to come over and be like, "This is how you do it." He's just like, "Yeah." Oh, your dummy's broken. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, I, feel, I mean, it's, it's a pretty cool um, knowledge to have. I mean, I see people. I mean, I remember like being so disturbed by the uh, how people. There is a lot of stigma on, let's say, things like epilepsy, for example. Right. Somebody hits, yeah, gets a crisis on a road, and and and, right. and, and on a, on the side of the road, there are things people speculate about how you may he's actually be he's possessed don't touch him he's possessed it could be that or yeah don't touch him or you may also get it or pass it on to your kids stuff epilepsy like that. is contagious yeah i remember being like really like that only guy only weird guy trying to help, help, help a guy not bite his tongue right or yeah so you, to you've get been in hydrated. situations like that though. i've been in a situation where i get to use it it's i'm really yeah i never yeah. have I've never been in a situation where I felt remotely called upon to use what I know. In 2015, a lady collapsed on a treadmill. Yeah. And I was... At your gym? At the gym. At your gym? Yes. Where you're working? Yeah. Uh -huh. And I was probably a little behind. I don't know where I was, but I wasn't on the gym floor. Yeah. So somebody yelled my name and then I came. But it was so funny to see how... Um, not the gym had people it was full of people but mm -hmm. not not many people not maybe because the the lack of confidence that they actually can help they they know what they can do or i don't know if it's lack of knowledge or lack of confidence or well like, that can be a scary situation like it is yeah traumatizing is so, someone about to die yeah. yeah this 
clearly obese woman probably with high blood pressure uh-huh. goes on a treadmill i don't know whether it was her first time or how what time she just collapses i mean whatever she was doing just did not get enough oxygen on the so brain so she, she just she, went down i'm sorry for making a joke out of it but did she like hit the treadmill and then get spit out the back i, I wasn't there but it's, <laughs> it seems like it, that's what happens so the good thing is that she didn't have any any, any damage like no external, injuries, right. yeah she just was unconscious but she yeah. was breathing she wasn't that's the thing i was to, i had to put her on the side open higher ways a little bit do the normal procedures mm-hmm. like secure the perimeters get people a little bit out so that she actually have enough air to breathe yeah you know, and then um yeah give her a little bit of cardiac massage and she actually yeah she came, came back. back to life she's okay <laughs> yeah well there you go then uh yeah an ambulance came and took her for extra examination and she's she, she basically yeah. got her life back well, yeah. we we, it's we all scary. Hope, yeah. We all hope to avoid these things. But once you do it once, you just yeah. Well, if you're mentally prepared, I think that yeah, yeah. So, so there you are. You're going back and forth to Kigali. You get certified as a personal trainer. You start doing PT work. And start doing one, PT. You were one. You were talking, telling me that you were basically the first, if not one, or one of the first personal trainers. In so here's the Rwanda. thing. Um, there was when I first started, I was going between gyms right this which is 2012 ish which were also yeah which were also um yeah in um hotels so there wasn't that many independent gyms like not many people did not really there was no invest. gym culture there wasn't there's just some barbells in the corner of a lobby yeah. hotel but if you went to novotel it was open at that time there was a, a good gym in there serena had a gym oh, okay and um every hotel basically and then others that had like some broken machines so would you train yeah, guests like or that. would you bring clients into the gym at the hotel because that's what the so gym how, how the thing started actually um first i was doing that uncertified so i was it was just out of passion like loving doing i mean you know when you read men's health a lot <laughs> The magazine, Pick, f- yeah. <laughs> Picking, I was a subscriber. I bought a couple of, of those in my day. I'll admit, it, I'll admit it. Yeah. So I wanted to like basically invest in the knowledge to train myself because I was so much into it. Right. And then uh, it would piss me off. I mean, kind of when somebody was doing something the wrong way, and not ma- adults aren't really good at taking advice from younger people. Yeah. So uh, yeah, there goes that early twenties guy telling some dude like yeah you're, doing um, you're breaking your back or yeah if you did yeah. this kind of extension you would target more isolate more your triceps and then therefore yeah especially uh, when you're trying to tell somebody that's going to the gym and trying to lift the heaviest thing they can find that that's not the way to do it yeah no i'm a man i can lift well yeah there's a lot of ego in weight rooms yeah and um so a lot a lot of it started by getting involved like that uninvited mm-hmm. and then many people really received it so well and then they would ask me like yeah when are you coming back again and they all they would ask me like okay am i doing it right if i'm at the gym at the same time as them so you got a reputation and then kind of yeah of this guy who's helping people freely right. there was this gym attendant this fitness instructor the guy who always has, is in the gym that is supposed to be solving those kind of problems but uh i don't know if um um I don't know, unmotivated or whatever. So they were just not doing that. So yeah. it's like a gym attendant. Well, if it's, if, I think if it's something where it's like if if teaching people how to lift properly and actually um, educating people was an add-on to his job, if he was just getting paid to be there, then what's yeah. the motivation for yeah, yeah. taking on clients, so to speak, if you're not getting paid extra? Yeah. So, But you were self-motivated. Fast, yeah, yeah. So fast forward, then um, um, there was... Um, you asked me a question, like whether I'm actually a, one of the first uh, personal trainers. You mentioned that you might have yeah, been. Yeah, um, like what what made me believe that is that I was working with gyms. I would go to like different gyms to train myself, and then um, after uh, establishing myself as as a trainer, like my struggles were around getting the gym managers to sort of understand what it is that I do. Like, w- w- by the way, are we going to pay you? Like, there was always this confusion. Then I'm like, nope, there's no salary, there's no nothing. It's just I'm here. And I'll be training that person who has to be a member. 
and uh, it's basically i mean i don't require anything from you basically did they know and you then, were making money hmm? did they know you were making money but that's the thing i mean they know that that kind of uh, service is compensated and uh, it's basically considered as making money inside someone else's business right yeah and that's where the friction comes in give me a cut and we're good <laughs> <laughs> give me a half yeah and most of them will be like, ah, no, we, we have guys here who help people. And yeah, so we, we, we yeah. Then um, so is that kind what of I came in was like a structure. I was this guy with a clipboard. I was so young, very mm -hmm. interested in uh, the details, taking numbers in and, and, uh, and doing things differently. So there was no, you could, I mean, uh, there was these fitness instructors that were like maybe gym uh, uh, how can I call it? Attendance. Attendance. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, at the end of every session of every aerobic class or whatever, they would do something with a person. It could be like mm -hmm. a nap session of fifteen minutes. It could be, <coughs> it could be helping them stretch, which was like commonly done. But then it wasn't something. I have that a question about stretching, by the way. Uh -huh. After this, <laughs> yeah. Then. Uh, um, but then they weren't doing any like uh, uh, any screening, any any structure, any structured PT, just uh, random uh, stuff. It was random stuff. Right. So yeah. So then um, that's yeah. I remember some of my first clients. I remember them by name, and and they were like. Uh, so basically, there was no culture of structured personal training, and you no, and you kind of had to create no, your own thing. Yeah, and to. Yeah, some of the early struggles was I was I remember I was charging five thousand an hour, five thousand a session, which wasn't even an hour; it was like an hour and a half. And to get to convince somebody who has a membership at a gym that, that it was worth it, that there is going to be an extra fee if yeah. I help you structure your training, yeah, therefore exactly. you can better achieve your goals. It was tough, but um, yeah, I mean, ten years later, um, PT is now what ten times that an hour. So they, I guess they understood the value of it. Well, I think, yeah, I think obviously you, you probably pioneered the culture here, but also the more people get exposed to sort of global trends. Fitness has mm. become much more popular. Lifting yep. weights has become much more popular in the yep. past decade than yep. it ever was previously. Yep. I would say through the two thousand, like the 90s and the 2000s, the, the cool thing was always, you know, you did exercise, aerobic exercise was really mm. cool. But yep. there, there was some point in, you know, after I would say, I don't know exactly when, but when people started to learn and the information started to be out there that lifting heavy things is really good for you. Yeah. And it's really important. Yeah. And it's probably actually more important than running but or aerobic exercise. You should have both. But on that subject, on that subject in particular, I mean, I mean, that's the time. I mean, shortly after that, I think that's when functional training was, was sort of invented or born or whatever as Fun a concept. Functional training, is that the, term, By the functional proper term? <laughs> no, by functional maybe I mean simply means uh, the transferability of an exercise. How I mean, no, it I get focuses it. on yeah. the movement instead of the. This is the how muscle. your body is designed to move. Yeah, and most of those things by transfer by being transferable, basically you find it in your everyday life. Right. So it's, it's like go to the gym to practice things that will help you carry a bag, will help you drive better, or will help you. Go not, up not, the stairs. Not have back problems. Not have back problems. Stuff like that. So or it was less about mm -hmm. the looks and yeah. So the old way, like you were talking about, was cardios were just like bike, swim, run kind of things. Well, it's kind of like the food pyramid, you know. And People just had a, a template. And they're just like, yeah, this is what <laughs> you should do. Yeah, and then um, uh, uh, lifting was just there. Like they knew, of course, the Schwarzeneggers. They uh, they knew the bodybuilding, and then they were like, there was nothing that connects the everyday people. Mm -hmm. to that and uh, then there was and myths there was myths like women a lot of myths yeah women still think to this day it's like if i lift weights i'll get too big like they'll get barky so yeah like, yeah not the way it works yep so then um yeah it's within the concept of functional training that actually people get to use a barbell for cardio which is yeah super no cool. i mean no i'm right there with you cardio should be i mean by the time your pulse is up if you're like 140 beats a minute it's basically whatever you're doing it's built in it's cardio. It's built in. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's built in. But I'm, I'm. What I guess what I mean is the concept that strictly doing cardio, mm. like for example, strictly doing cycling is bad for you. If all you do, if you don't, all, yeah. if all you do is chronic cycling, yeah, it's not good for your health. Yeah, 
your health will deteriorate. Will, yeah, definitely. You know, your your muscle skeletal structure, your bone density. You know, if you do it too much, really a lot, you know, your heart gets enlarged. You got the yeah, you get, can get some AFib or whatever. But <clears throat> maybe maybe the 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 technical part of uh, breaking down that kind of stuff is for for the next time we talk. Mm-hmm. Um. Let's 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 just wrap up your history here, man. Yeah, but you had a question about stretching. I'm gonna get to it. Okay, okay. I'm gonna cool. get to it. Let cool. me just let me just rapid fire get through yeah. get through, um, from this this period where you got certified and you started basically on gyms, yeah, breaking new ground and creating a lane for yourself, yeah, doing uh, being a fitness professional in Kigali, yeah, and then uh, you met your wife in. I, I met. In, yeah. 2015 yes and so basically uh she's from she's from denmark, denmark yeah right. and we met when she was here during her uh, master's uh program right so you doing met field, field work so yeah we met and and shortly after that she had to leave the country yeah but she started dating you started a relationship we s- kind of yeah so but i remember yeah doing um you started basically with the point i'm trying to get to is you started a life where you were going back and forth between Copenhagen and Kigali. Yeah, when I went, of course, when you get committed, when I got Other committed. Other too. Yeah. So, yeah, we started planning uh, vacations and, 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 and stuff like that. So I remember... But that's not easy, man. Like It's not easy, yeah. It's being not, from he- being from here or uh, being from anywhere, starting up a long-distance relationship and then actually that involves following up. through with it, <laughs> that's a lot of work. A long-distance relationship that involves 6,000 kilometers. I've been it, in it, two long distance relationships. It's not a cheap one too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but the good thing is that frequent I mean, flyer miles. Yeah, yeah. You worked out. Shortly after that, fast forward 2017, we got married. We got had married. a kid. You had a kid. Came back here. Came back here to Kigali. Um, yeah, where I and got that, involved fully with Kali Fitness. Yeah, and, and then you you purchased the gym you yeah, used to work at, Cali Fitness. Yeah, then uh, so now you're a gym owner, entrepreneur, entrepreneur, father, <laughs> husband. Yeah, I'm involved in a lot of other small stuff. But you really uh, built up your life, and I mean, maybe we can go back there at some point if it's interesting. But mm. uh, you, you created quite a life for yourself. But um, the w- the thing about that story that I find curious is that you know you hear so many stories about. Um, People that get into relationships with people that they meet and end up, you know, doing something abroad, and yeah. you end up, you know, they just end up being part of the diaspora. Typically, yep. Yep. they end up, you know, like once they go, yep. most people once they I'll leave say, yeah. um, Kigali yeah. or Countries. Nairobi, where they're from, they go to the Europe, they go to America, whatever. Typically, they set up shop there and they don't come back. Yeah, you know, that's that's the the majority of the stories you hear. Yeah, I mean, nowadays there's 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 more of a trend of people that have lived lives abroad um repatri- repatriating and uh, bringing their kids back home actually yeah there's sort of a, a return if you will but um but you guys it seemed to you, it seemed like it was a pretty clear decision for you guys to move back it, here. it was and i guess the question is right why did we move back well no it's not, i mean i can understand why you moved back but yeah. i what i'm interested in is your personal reasons because from where i'm sit, like I don't know how I wouldn't, <laughs> I'm gonna be careful how I say this. Mm-hmm. Um, let me just put it this way: Kigali, Rwanda is not the easiest place to yeah. create your own lane and make something new happen. From especially from zero, was that yeah. a lot of help? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's. Um, and this is we're not just talking about you. I mean, obviously, it's hard enough for you, but she's from somewhere else now. She's you know an expat. I mean, she's yeah married to you now, so she's mm-hmm. basically Rwandan. But yeah. And you have a kid, and it's like, okay, we're both going to come back and do this thing and, in and Kigali. This, yeah. So, I mean, there is um, there's this thing with Europe, I mean, developed countries' life. Mm-hmm. So, but, I, but it's not like Rwanda is slow, but I also, like, it wasn't about the speed of life, but it's the loop mm-hmm. you, you uh, that I just don't get. I mean, it's so hard for people to, in, in, in European madness, in terms of like no uh, i get uh, you uh, uh, yeah like i've spent enough time in europe to working know what you up mean. and getting to job taking the same bus and connecting to the same train and then talking to the same people struggling to fix them um, to 
sneaking a, a drink with a friend because of that crazy madness and and you do that for five ten years and 16 years i mean it's so programmed you feel like you almost feel like you are in a pre-planned system that was right. written by somebody else and you are just living in it I mean, do you know this book uh, uh who moved my cheese no i never heard of it it's a tiny book like this so that talks about my step we're living in a maze and um, someone was throwing in cheese every now and then and then their everyday job was to just sort of Find move the around cheese. finding the cheese and then there was this one my mouse mouse that started <laughs> going exploring cha- no challenging the, the the status quo like i mean it was like but why like if what happens if i stop what did he do go on a strike did he what? stop eating <laughs> It's yeah. I mean, it's um, it stopped one day, and then he got hungry, and then it was like, but they, I need to know where the cheese comes from. I feel like, I mean, I'm, I'm in this. You're full design. of shit. Yeah. What book is this? So <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe you. No, believe me. It's called it, Who Moved My Cheese. I mean, the the first book is called I'm No Who Moved My Cheese, and then some guy called. Who mo- oh, who, I read that. You read it. I didn't understand you at first, but it's it's not a real story. It's n- well, but it's a good uh, story me- about that kind of metaphor. life. It's a metaphor. You know who gave me that book? Ah, uh, who? Tom Ritchie. Really? Yeah. That guy likes you, <laughs> because if had I had I read that little book, it's it's That's like a crazy. it's like a one morning kind of book. Had I read every fifteen year old, if, you, if you're a good should, reader, I feel like every fifteen year old should read that book. It's it's and there is a second one where some guy answers him by a book. The second book is called "I Moved Your Cheese." They basically break down. One. Yeah, it's in that crazy uh, mice and maze analogy where they break down this crazy system. That's so fun. Yeah, and it's um, so uh, my life in Copenhagen was basically full of that. So it's a very. Uh, th- let me put it in other terms for for listeners if they haven't been to Europe, or for listeners that haven't been to the Western world, mm. is that life in the Western world is very saturated. It's very yeah. built up. There's a lot yeah. of technology. There's a lot of infrastructure, especially in the city. Everything yep. is programmed. Everything is built up to function a certain way. Yep. And if you look at it on its surface, there's not many options. You either go along with it and you integrate. Yeah. Or you're gonna have, you're gonna, you're gonna suffer. It's gonna be difficult. Yeah. So there's not really, either you get with the program or, or, or there's or, not much or to there's do. Friction. Yeah. To innovate is difficult. Yeah. To, to find space between. The rat race to innovate yeah. uh, shouldn't be difficult if you were from the same system, from the same culture. But uh, coming as an outsider, I I coming disagree. as an outsider without a cultural background yeah. of how things work, without having grown with everything that that is that was built with your presence, mm-hmm. it's so hard to come and then realize what can be actually innovated. Well, I disagree with that a little bit. I'm oh. going to push back because <laughs> I. My because fear. one of the things I struggled, I mean, why wh- 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 we're still here, was to realize my impact. I wasn't seeing anything. I mean, I'm not afraid to be a small fish in a big pond. Right. But uh, the impact, you, I mean, in Rwanda, you come here, you do I things. I know exactly it's, what you mean. It's so, it's so easy to... to it's really not meaningful. It, it's, yeah, there is a sense of meaning when, yeah, you, when yeah. you're here. Absolutely. So, I feel uh, the same way about my sport. People yeah. ask me like, why don't you go get a job, go get a job with a professional team? Mm. I just like, well, because doing cycling in the West is not interesting. It's not interesting. They've, they've got to You don't handle. move the needle fast. Well, it's not just that you don't move or the needle Or in a remarkable fast. way. Yeah. I mean, cycling's a tool. Yeah. What you do is a tool. Yeah. And what's most fulfilling and, and brings you the most meaning and is, is the most interesting is to practice your craft in a place where it's impactful where yeah. you can innovate yeah. or where there's work to be done. Yeah. And when you go somewhere where a million other people are already doing exactly the thing you want to do, I, you're, you're talking about how it's difficult to innovate if you're an outsider. That can be true if you don't understand the system or the technology or the language or the, you know, the, fi- the, finer, the finer points or methods of a culture. But yeah. I think also if you, come, if you grow up inside of the institutions and the culture and the thinking of a culture, it can be hard to see outside of, and an outsider has, in my opinion, actually the best chance once they are fluent in yeah. whatever's going on, yeah. or remote, like they have, they can speak the language of whatever it is. And when yeah. I say language, I mean you know whatever it is, technology systems, yeah, yeah. whatever yeah. the thinking is. Yeah. An outsider has an ability to see things in a different way. They don't have the same disadvantage of 
that blind spot. Yes, but also if um if you they have the coming tools. in a system, if you have the tools, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you're right on that one. You're right, but then there is a big advantage in having because you know every innovation, every new idea, every creation mm-hmm. is a continuation of something that pre-existed. There right. is nothing really new when well, you think of it. My one of my so, favorite quotes is that the <laughs> the light bulb was not created from the continuous refinement of the candle. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but so yeah, to the, to your point about these two things, though, the way that the, so I mean, cultural background yeah. helps. Sure. In 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 yeah. Basically, if you want to do something, you want to accomplish something, and you're building a team, you want both people on the team. Yeah. But this is the importance of diversity. Yeah. Don't burn down the system, but hey, new new energy and new is new needed. influences is. It can't. It, it should be, and it can be a very, very positive thing. Yeah, it, it is. In fact, I mean, in fact, if you think about, I mean, this is getting. I'm not really well versed in this topic, but if you think about where civilizations first became really good at technology and specialization, hmm. I think it's um, Steven Pinker likes to point out um, in some of his writings that. These places that really became superpowers of technology and moving the world forward, moving humanity forward, were thoroughfares. Yeah. This is where, you know, shipping links came together. This is where, you know, the route from here to there passed, you yeah. know. And so these these places were places where there was a lot of influx of different kinds of people. Yeah. Different energy, different ideas, different perspectives. And that's, you know, so that information sort of consolidated there. Yeah. Specialists were able to start doing more and more specialized things. And that's that's really powerful. That's that yeah, that's very strong. Yeah. Which is one thing that I think when you you know, we were talking earlier about, you know, the running phenomenon in uh in Eldoret and we we're comparing it to the cycling here and asking the question, where are we? Rwanda's very good at being aware of the value of having people come here, holding conferences here. Yeah having meetings here yeah. in terms of um, economic endeavors, in terms of politics, in terms yeah. of, you know, conferences, you know, putting yeah. putting minds and people and technology together. Yeah. I think that uh, Rwanda is doing a really good job of that. It just hasn't reached that mentality and that, that sort of practice hasn't reached cycling or the sporting level. You know, it's kind of like... But that's, what I, that's why I was saying that are we asking so much uh, uh, on 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 a, on such a young sport in Rwanda. No, no, no I don't think that that. But that the the age of the sport shouldn't be the limitation. Because let's let's here's all you all you really need. Yeah. Is the proper tools. Yeah. And I think, in my opinion, having coached and worked in Rwanda for six years, mm-hmm. in my opinion, being in the community, that whatever you inject in the community into the community in terms of cycling, yeah. in terms of the tools of cycling, yeah. And it's not that expensive. It just has to be the right tools. Yeah. If you start kids at a young age and you make sure there's enough bikes in there, yeah, it'll fucking happen by itself. Everybody, like kids, want to ride bikes. Kids yeah. want to race. They're drawn to it. Yeah. There's a magic about a race. As soon as you say, "Here's the start line. Here's the finish line. Let's get together and let's race. do this." Yeah. There's a magic to it, and it's not just the kids racing. The whole community is drawn to it. Oh, yeah. You know, it's not. The, it's not anywhere near the level of football. Yeah, but it has the same sort of magic of there's a game on, Boom, yeah, and everyone's drawn to it. So yeah. it if it if it the ripple effect throughout the community is huge. And yes, the sport is young in Rwanda. For example, like in Eritrea, they've had cycling for almost as long as there's been yeah. cycling. Yeah, since the, the arrival of the Italians. Yeah. yeah, and the Italians are some of the first people to ever race bikes. You know, yeah. we're, we're talking the Eritreans basically would have had an exposure to bike racing within decades of it ebbing anywhere. Yeah. So, so you could ask the same question about the Eritreans. It's like, why are the Eritreans so good? Well, they have this culture and they have this critical mass. Yeah. But if you go to Asmara, the capital of Eritrea, yeah, there's not much else to do there. Yeah. Really isn't. It's kind of one game in town. How are they? Do they have a, a, a continental clubs? You know, I don't I, hear I mean, I don't because know. they always come here competing as a country. So I, I don't I, think they have a UCR the continental team. Wow. I don't think they do. But you know what? It's that's shocking. I mean, 
what a country like Eritrea? I don't think Eritrea I don't think it is. I don't think it is, and here's why. Okay. Being a UCI continental team doesn't really change much, in my opinion. Well, I would it assume can, it can. The, uh-huh. It can. Like for example, it can get it can get you more invitations to races. But yeah. unless it, international exposure. But for example, like we you know you know, before 2019, Rwanda didn't have a UCI continental team. Yeah. Now we have two. Yeah. But those teams are not run differently than they were before. Okay. Okay. There's not a lot of... So it does mean, I think, you know, it does mean that they can get invited to a race and go to a race themselves as a legit team Yeah. where the race organizer has to invite UCI teams versus composite teams, which are just assembled randomly. Yeah. Um. So, but it it costs money and it doesn't change that much, unless the team is structured differently. Yeah, to take advantage of the of the um, access of to being te- the UCI, yeah. yeah, yeah. But I think there's a lot of development that could and should happen before being a UCI team makes much of a difference. But this is getting really technical. Yeah, and uh, you know, people that are in cycling watching this will will get what I'm saying, but. I'm I've increasingly I'm increasingly dubious of the utility of being UCI certified. Mm-hmm. For me, and that used to be really kind of my orientation towards like how do we get our kids onto UCI teams? How yeah. do we get these kids into Europe? And that's yeah. still the main focus of all the organizations that work in cycling in Africa, yeah. almost all the federations, like that's the dream. Yeah. How do we develop our athletes? Yeah. How do we get someone to the you know, the UCI training center yeah. or get them onto a European team or club. Yeah, yeah. And actually, you know, a lot of people in, in African countries that are trying to build their cycling, they dream about coming to Rwanda to train. Yeah. Because they don't know anything about it for, except for on the outside, they can see that we've done you well. Just, so yeah. they just assume you don't, yeah. that there's some kind don't of magic. Some, some kind of, yeah, structure, some right. kind of tough, hardcore training given to kids here. And yeah. what they What they're alluding to and what they see from the outside, even if they wouldn't articulate it this way, is that there's a culture of cycling here. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And if you can just get there, if you can just be around it, yeah, you'll be better. Yeah. Right? And that's sort of the dream of any athlete that wants to be a part of something. They want to go where the action is. And right now, the action it has been since the dawn of time, basically. The action is in Europe, you know? Yeah. All these other countries, you know, whether it's Australia or the U.S. or... You know, Colombia, Colombia's done come out of nowhere in the past couple of decades. I mean, they have a cycling history, but they've yeah. really become one of the most competitive nations in the world. Yeah. They've built the, the key thing. Oh, I'm, I'm getting, uh, I'm not really, <laughs> I'm not really following a coherent train of thought here. Basically, mm-hmm. what I was trying to say is the actions in Europe, right? Yeah. So that's what everybody wants to get. Yeah, yeah. Right. And, and 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 you you believe that it's actually very toxic for, to no, no, to no. to make it the aim the end the, the 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 dream. I wouldn't. I don't know if I'd use the word toxic. I think that if you want to talk about, it de- de- depends on how, who you're talking to and how you're phrasing it and what you mean. I think so. I, basically, I mean, he's no. he's he's something. So, shooting for UCI means you gotta get money to burn because cycling is a very expensive, expensive. Hu- it's, it's expensive just going to europe is hugely expensive yes yeah. so are you saying that let's say as a nation that is trying to grow a culture of cycling there are so many things we should aim for that are that are in line with what our organic way we want to do things because there's not a lot of money to inject into uh, uh, UCI continental teams now, so that they can actually even because if if they in, get invited, let's say you, let's say you, uh, the team in um, Wamagana gets mm. invited to let's say Miran Sandem or, well that can't happen because the rankings are different. <laughs> <laughs> they they can get invited to a certain level to, of race. To, but, yeah, I mean, but to some here's the thing. Race. Here's the thing. It's it's not a magic bullet, and what you need to develop cycling is that culture. Yeah that culture and that critical mass. And it needs, I mean, so, but it needs to be a competent culture, right? It has to have good practices. Like for example, in Eritrea, everyone's riding bikes. They have a deep, deep cycling culture. Yeah. And they basically know what they're doing, but it's very much, the knowledge is very much held in a, I hope I don't offend 
any uh, any of the red camels I mean, yeah. by saying this. But it's it's a knowledge that's sort of held in the culture, sort of embodied, it's sort of intuitive, mm. right? It's learned, it's passed on, it's generational, it's just everywhere. Yeah. And so it's sort of, the culture is so infused with cycling and has been for so long. And, you know, they're kind of adept at it biologically. Yeah. You know, that it just, it's just a, this sort of match made in heaven and they just churn out these really talented athletes. But they're missing pieces of the puzzle. You know, they're missing infrastructure, they're missing enough equipment, they're missing support, you yeah. know. But most of their limits have to do with, you know, Eritrean problems in general. Yeah. Not just not necessarily cycling problems. So there's there's the way the the way you would improve on Eritrean cycling yeah. is a completely different equation than the way you would improve on Rwandan cycling. Yeah. Even though when you see them come together in a race, they go head to head and you think these guys are equals. Yeah. Well that's a beautiful thing about bike racing or sport is that it often puts us on a level playing field, whatever the format is. But I wouldn't say that aiming for UCI cycling, UCI teams, European cycling is toxic per se. I just think it's um, the cart before the horse. So when you when what when what builds champions, if that's the metric we want to use, yeah. is this culture and this exposure to sport, competent sport, knowledge, but also but more so the example. Yeah, that's what we should seek to build, and what you want is as many people as possible on bikes on bikes yeah. and as many races as possible locally right and yeah nationally and even if you know you go from having 30 guys in a race 50 guys in a race and they're always the same guys everywhere yeah even if you go from that to having 200 guys and those 200 guys are not that good or not that proficient yeah simply by having critical mass simply by raising the level of competition iron mm -hmm. sharpens iron yeah you will produce a more skilled talent pool yeah you will produce and the beautiful thing about this concept doing like let's say injecting that more bikes more races yeah introducing critical mass to the cycling community in rwanda is that because they're young yeah because the cycling culture is a nascent culture and they don't have that saturation and that built up way of doing things. Yeah. You get to go you get to build from scratch. You get to say how does this work best for us? Mm. Right? Like yeah. like I love the example of football where, you know, colonialists introduced football in South Africa and their, you know, their thinking was, you know, we're going to teach savages how to behave. We're going to teach them principles by teaching them how to play a sport <laughs> with rules. Yeah. Right? And it backfired because basically what they did is they took the sport and they made it their own. Yeah. They played it their own way. And now the whole world plays the way the Africans the, play. The Africans play. They yeah. changed the game. Yeah. Now, I mean, people that are experts in, in football are can debate me on that. I'm not an expert, but from what I understand, that's kind of the history of football in Africa. But I think the same thing could apply to cycling. Why do we, why is the only goal to, you know, have our, our race be a higher ranked UCI race? Yeah, that does bring more competitive teams to Rwanda we get to compete with. Yeah. That's great. But if we haven't changed anything about how we prepare and bring our level up, all we're going to do is get our ass kicked once a year. And then, uh, yeah. Right. And it's like when it comes to, you know, the, the UCI teams that really have a strong program in Europe, it's like the kid that, uh, I just did the last episode with Uhirue Bizerenos. Yeah. He's a sprinter. He's one of the only sprinters in Rwanda. He's really a smart kid, really talented. He got this chance to go race and he got signed with the, the ASOS Quebec Continental Team, a development squad. Yeah. He left last week and I think he's going to do really well. But like, they only had one spot. Yeah. And he only got that spot because another kid, I won't mention who or from where, turned the spot down. Okay. So. You know, there's very few. It's like, you know, how many pe how many people can you get together and say, okay, you're all going to prepare and compete, but only one of you is going to make it. Yeah. It's like the odds are too shitty. Very, yeah. And then when you get there, even as an American, when you get to Europe, or you get you get introduced to the scene, like your like your feelings about life in Copenhagen. It's very it's done a certain way and there's yeah. very there's it's very difficult to see anywhere where you can inject your own prints. 
your own methods, your own flavor, your own yeah, yeah. contribution, it seems like the only option is to do it like they do it and try yeah. to do it better than they do it. Yeah, yeah. Which is kind of an absurd proposition, really. Well, why, why, why do? Last we- I checked, there's <laughs> no fish that has ever learned how to fly and then fly better than a bird. So we we kind of went we going down one rabbit hole after the other. There's so much we can talk about that we're yeah. we're gonna come back and do a part two, folks. Uh, maybe even a part three. There's a lot of things that. Ivan and I uh, and I could uh, could delve into. We could delve into the sport. We could delve into culture. We could delve into a lot of things that are much broader than Rwanda, much broader than our specialties, because uh, we're both interested in uh, digest a broad spectrum of uh, of topics. Well, we're gonna try. We're gonna wrap this up and just focus on some fitness stuff, some some practical things. I have a question Enough for you. Enough of bikes. But bikes will always be tangent, tangentially, I can't even say the word, related as long as I'm in the seat, man. <laughs> Cycling's my life. But um, first, first, let me ask you a question. Yeah. So I'm, um, I had a motorcycle accident in uh, the summer of 2019 where I broke my hand and uh, chipped my the femur head of my right, right femur, so the head that goes into the socket of the knee got chipped off. Yeah. And so I'm missing a piece. And my knee was super painful, for, painful yeah. for a while, and I wasn't able to get back on the bike for months. Finally, did was in a ton of pain for a long time, and now the pain is largely gone. But I've got I'm dealing with you know an imbalance, some some weakness, and so I'm just starting to get back into being able to do simple movements, functional movements like you talked about before, yeah. functional fitness, yeah, which is something that every cyclist needs. If you want to be a well-rounded athlete, even if you want to get the most of yourself out of yourself on the bike, you need to do functional things. Yeah, you know, uh, you know, back in the day, they used to think that cyclists didn't need to lift weights, but now every now seri- you have every, to do it. Yeah, every serious professional cyclist does strength work. Yeah. So I mean, I've just started with the six kilo kettlebell, doing squats, set to ten. Yeah. Uh, deadlifts and um, I call them crab walks. You know, when you put mm-hmm, the power mm-hmm, band, is mm-hmm. that what you call them? Yeah. I think there's probably a more a more crab work. <laughs> yeah, it's like the inverted uh, uh, bear crawl. Yeah. So what, the ones I do is I just put the power band, the stretchy um, mm-hmm. resistance band around my around just below my knees. Yeah. I do a partial squat. Yeah. And I just do the do, 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 do side ah. to side lateral. Uh yeah yeah. So you're what you're doing is you you're you're training your stability, your hip flexors, and your glutes. Yeah yeah. And you know, two months ago, three months ago, if I tried to do those, I would almost fall we, over. We call those duck walks. Duck walks, crab walk, duck walk, mm. whatever it is. You look, you look <laughs> funny when you're doing it, but they're yeah, they're super cool. They're not easy with and your heaps. Yeah, yeah, they're very, they're very. It's yeah. a really good and exercise your to do. Control. Yeah, yeah. I want to get to the point where I can do you know full kettlebell swings and lift more, and I'm actually able to do it now without not being able to walk two two days later. Yeah, and. um and the pain in my knee has subsided. It still makes noise. There's a lot of scar tissue in there. But what I was wondering is, you know, I'm always sort of exploring this space of how the proper way is to combine strength training with endurance work, mm-hmm. you know, because training on the bike is a, a fairly different stimulus than yeah. lifting heavy things. Yeah. And so, you know, I always try to, especially with trying to get some mobility back. Yeah. I was thinking about the dynamic of mobility versus stretching. Strength training. And I always feel like when you're lifting, especially if you're lifting heavy, mm-hmm. that you don't want to stretch immediately before or afterwards. You want to separate your stretching and your lifting. Mm-hmm. Do I have that right? Well. <laughs> because what you're doing is you're tearing muscle fibers, in essence. Do you want to When do you st- lift, do yes. Do you want to do stretching near that or do you want to wait a day, separate it a little bit? It depends, and because stretching is awesome, and you you can do it literally anytime, mm-hmm. inside a workout or before a workout, and then after a workout. But so isn't, what isn't you're it true? Doing, isn't uh-huh? it true that if you stretch at least aggressively before lifting, that you're not helping yourself lift? When you when you stretch before lifting, you don't help yourself lift. What it, yeah, what but basically, about? if you if let's say you're fit, you've been doing it for a while, and you're mm-hmm. going into a lifting session, you're going to yeah. do you know a full a full set of squats. Yeah. Right? Do you do you want to stretch beforehand? 
Yeah. Or do you just want to limber yeah. up? Yeah, yeah. And there are all kinds of stretching. So if you're doing something to, let's say, open up your hips, and you need a couple of dynamic stretching. Dynamic. That's yeah. the, that's the thing. I'm so talking about dynamic, dynamic versus like static, muscle. Static stretching, muscle pulls and hold. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Those ones are can even be dangerous when you do them before workout because your muscle doesn't have the full range of motion. Mm-hmm. I mean, your articulation doesn't have the full range of motion. So your mm-hmm. muscle cannot stretch to its full capacity. Mm-hmm. If it's a biceps, for example, uh, when you wake up, it's like in this kind of mode. And then you get, I mean, probably this is the wrong example, but most muscles actually can't stretch to their full length mm-hmm. when, when, when you are in, in, in a cold uh, uh, state. Right. Maybe so you need a warm up. You need to, yeah. That's the. That's when you need to do whatever you're doing. It has to be dynamic because it sort of opens up the body, the muscle. Right. But what I would call that, as I would call that, you know, dynamic mobility. I mean, I'm talking about more like aggressive stretching, where you're just like, I'm, I'm missing flexibility in this area. Or as a cyclist, you know, your glutes and your hamstrings and your quads are things that you need to stretch consistently yeah. because they, yeah. you know, these are the things that you're really using chronically. Yeah. So like, you know, when I go in and say I'm gonna do, you know. I'm going to do pigeon pose. I'm going to do an aggressive hamstring stretch. You yeah. know, it's like I'm talking about I'm talking about that close to the lifting. Yeah, I mean, obviously, because the lifting, it's I mean, there is the stat every I mean, there is you you put yourself in motion with extra load. So that means if your muscles and your ligaments and mm-hmm. if you're basically not What's the word? Like, I, I get what you're saying about warm up, and I get yeah. what you're saying about mobility. I'm yeah. talking about I'm talking about elongating the muscle. I'm talking about like let's say I just did set my full set of uh, squats. I'm done with my squats. I've mm-hmm. done three sets of whatever, right? Mm-hmm. And, and I push myself. Yeah, like I'm in a program and I push myself. Do I want to go and stretch my hamstrings afterwards, or do I want to do it tomorrow? Definitely, yeah. Right after. Right after. Yeah. It's like a jump start to your recovery. Is it? Yes. Because I would, in my mind, I was thinking like, okay, we're, you know, we're, we're challenging the muscle fibers. We're breaking some of them. We're, we're doing some breakdown. Yeah. Additional stretching on top of that would be like more damage, wouldn't it? Not really. Because uh, the muscle isn't actually broken per se, like as it happens. Like the, the, the I mean, it's not like the uh, inside on the muscle fiber, it's not like you see uh, broke, uh, I was gonna say brokage, is that a word? It's not like you tears. see particles, tears. Tears, uh, yeah. yeah. But so, there's, there's tiny ones th- happening. They they do, they do happen. And then it's when actually the next day, the soreness you feel will come from the process of healing. Yes, it has happened, but then it's not really significant to a point where you feel like pulling a muscle when you're stretching after mm-hmm. will maybe rip it apart or something but your muscles are going to be more vulnerable at that time right they are they're in a very painful state they are very vulnerable and um, you should be everybody should be careful on the length in terms of timing you hold a certain pose if you're stretching because uh well i was just i was just thinking about it i guess this is kind of a little bit technical but like i like for example i know that if you do aggressive stretching before you lift that Mm -hmm. your maximal lift power is reduced uh, is that backed by science? I'm though? pretty sure it's backed by empirical science. I like I if you want to do like if you're going for your max lift. Yeah, you don't want to do a bunch of aggr- you want to do your mobility and warm yeah. up, of course. Yeah, yeah. but like r- aggressive stretching. Yeah, no. But but here's the thing. So we're talking about like the kind of business I'm into. Speaking of fitness, yeah, is for the average Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Okay. So the, I'm talking those about are the people. Different. Yeah, those I'm are not the people yeah. <laughs> who they don't deal a lot with max lifts, one hour aim. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we may, of course, I use it to to evaluate their strength and their progression. Right. But I one, use ra- it, one rep. Max. One rep max. Yeah. So, uh, but um, this kind of um, athlete zone mm-hmm. that it's like that bull, yeah, that that Spanish game with a bull. What is it? It's all sport. Maybe I call it bull a fighting. The, the bull fighting. It's like that state of a bull before. Uh-huh. Have you seen uh, uh, heavily uh, uh, weightlifters in the in the back uh, before they go to the stage to to make that one lift? They're going to get in the zone. Yeah, they are like in that full bull zone. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. where they're like they, they are massed so that the concentration starts from there. 
Mm-hmm. So an interaction with a reporter or with your girlfriend or whoever you, you, you may tunnel have vision. there, tunnel you vision. need tunnel yeah. vision. Yeah. So it's just pretty much every, almost the same as what you were doing, but physically speaking. Mm-hmm. I mean, every uh, movement you're yeah. doing prior a major lift like I, that. Of course, that's true because for racing and After all, everything, yeah, the, yeah. you are in one system of energy. Yeah. So y- they are costing you. So mm. obviously there is going to be a yeah. little less. I mean, the less movements you're doing before a big lift, the better because you're going to be. Yeah, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about I'm talking about how you treat your muscles if you're trying to build strength. Mm-hmm. And I may, maybe I'm just kidding. And this to is build strength. This is a nerdy. It's a nerdy question because it's like I am actively trying to build mobil- mobility, especially in my hips, especially in my right leg. You mm-hmm. know, and so there are times where I'll push and I'll, mm-hmm. it's painful. I'll push to a painful stretch. You know, I'll hold a stretch for over a minute. You know, mm-hmm. and I'm getting there slowly. Mm-hmm. I'm not tearing muscles, but I'm getting there slowly. Yeah. So I was. My question was perhaps too nerdy and too technical, but basically I'm saying like, okay, as I'm lifting and I'm increasing the weight that I can lift yeah. and I'm in this state and yeah. what I want to do is transfer power to the bike. Yeah. You know, is- Are you saying that you may be compromising the strength gain because you not, because of your stre- stretches? I'm asking if it's helping or hurting or if, or if it would be better to do it the day after. Like I'm doing every other day right now because I'm lifting light and I'm just trying to basically get the, the, neur- the neuromuscular yeah, p- patterns going and strengthening ligaments. That's mostly what you're doing when yeah. you first start again. Here's the problem with most of, uh, you even see it on these uh, social media trainers, whatever, everybody's now an, like an expert of some sort. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Depending on who's, who's judging or whatever. Yeah. So, uh, science, the, the exercise science is not really a black and white thing. Right. Everything it's happens personal. in this, yeah, spectrum. It's, it, it, yeah, in the spectrum, in right. this space uh-huh. that is very gray between both ends. Right, and then that's when you get to break down things like, and then talk about how much of it, because you can't say it's how much, when, how timing, much, yeah. when, like all the variables. Yeah. And that's where uh, your stretches uh, they fall in, in in that kind of answer, like. Uh, how much uh, if you feel like I'm pulling uh, a muscle after I, I have done what I, what I multiple feel, concentrations? Yeah, that's with how. It. That's the feeling that I get. How much? I feel how, like the muscles the are vulnerable. I feel like they're vulnerable and they're in a state of having been really stressed. Yeah, and that stretching them at least aggressively right after. Yeah isn't the best idea and that I should let them recover a little bit and then be gentle and go into those deeper stretches on the days off, but. That's just an intuition, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, we, Bro, if, if we, we depend, you, depending on uh, if we're talking about a hamstring, a ham, hamstring is is on a stretched state all the time. So if you're standing like down, whatever, unless your legs are bent, yeah. But it's what it does. It's not like you. Uh, there is even a possibility to prevent it from yeah. From, I think from being stretched. I think this is functional versus um, specific sport or trying to get somewhere but anyways let's let me let me let me search for some papers mm-hmm. and we'll talk about this next time okay let me cool. let me search some papers out and i'll have some, i'll do my homework i would love to know yeah the impact yeah. of uh since you failed to answer of, my question of, bro of, i'm of, so of. disappointed man <laughs> jesus um but but let's uh but yeah we just we're gonna wrap up and we're gonna t- you're gonna touch a little bit on you know what the world is like right now we're still dealing with restrictions to covid mm-hmm. your gym has been closed for how long for a year now for Almost a year, a year. now because we closed in march they let yeah. they let you open it for like what was it a week it was like a week yeah with so technically it was actually longer it was actually longer but what happened is that they let us open with a lot of um, restrict um, um, right uh, regulations so to comply yeah and distancing, all stuff, cl- yeah. yeah so by the time we finished actually investing into all of that which also costed us uh, a lot of cash i bet it did they were like uh <coughs> cases are going over the roof uh, we gotta shut you down again i so, know it was like a week and they're like psych close yeah it was uh it was yeah but I mean, but at that time, of course, we had gone through all kinds of emotional what states was interesting, on this issue. What was interesting is that this is kind of a, you've been respectful about it, but you had been kind of trying to get the word out, like fitness is important, health yeah. is important. It's yeah. maybe one of the most important things right now. Yeah. And you actually had, you actually wrote uh, sort of an open letter mm. 
It got published in Tarifa. Yeah. I read it and it was very, it was very well-rounded and made very good points. Mm. And I felt like maybe that might've been something that, um, you know, got, got through to someone at the ministry of health and they were like, you know, maybe he has a point. Yeah. Let's open these gyms. Well, unfortunately, I mean, it's, um, we've been, of course, doing all kinds of lobbying in so many forms it could be that it could be emailing and talking to people and so yeah. you have been doing things behind they the are, scenes yeah okay. a lot a lot i mean every opening like that requires a lot of <laughs> yeah that's how it seemed i mean that's yeah, the only thing i they saw have, yeah they have been i think by yeah so what's although, the response are you getting a response so here's the thing like by like with my presence on social media and stuff um i, I on this particular issue I, I kind of stopped because uh i felt like I was picking up a few more enemies than friends right with this issue. I mean COVID is a dangerous problem itself. No, it's very real, absolutely. And yeah. we need to really deploy every one of our like every resource we have to fight this pandemic. Right. To go through this pandemic. I mean to fight the the, the virus itself. Mm -hmm. But then when you look at the uh, how things come into play actually when you are uh, implementing let's say a policy or uh, a regulation or, or like things just start start going uh, and unfortunately i mean we've seen how like some business people people's business clause and uh, um, politics gets in the way a bit and then things don't always at the end become about the virus and then that's what's shocking it's yeah it's tricky it's tricky i think for any administration to apply policies to protect the public and have it be science-based and have it be consistent i mean there's a lot of yeah, things yeah. there's a lot of things to keep track yeah, of there's it's a lot of things to keep track not an easy yeah. job uh, you gotta give it to that to, yeah to those two institutions like rbc and uh minister of health yeah they are the, yeah they have extremely busy and yeah it's a tough spot to be in because remember they are the ones involved in every decision that opens up businesses right. opens up anything it has to be based on something right, right. and uh, lots of other things uh, other political forces pulling yeah. left and right that doesn't necessarily require a logical not always analysis. unfortunately but not the, always but the point that so, you've been making out there is that you know which is a point that I've heard a lot of people that, that are scientists and are you know students of this kind of thing and know what they're talking about is that you know yeah we need to protect ourselves from contamination and from spreading the virus we need to make sure that we you know act in a responsible way so that we're not making it worse yeah and we're trying to protect the public but at the same time we need to we need ways we need mechanisms to sustain and maintain our health at the yeah. same time yeah how do we do that because here's the, th the thing i mean it's a very interesting question um, like there was even I a point. Like there was even a point where they wouldn't want, didn't want us to ride our bikes outside alone. Yeah, yeah. Which so, I mean, in my opinion, sense. yes. People, uh, the pandemic is a, uh, the virus is is serious and it's killing a lot of people. Uh -huh. But still, it's not killing a lot of people. More more people than what lifestyle uh, choices are killing. Right. So heart, heart issues. Heart issues, diabetes, heart yeah. pressure, all kinds think, of NCDs. But you know what the tricky thing is? Yeah. Is that when people have comor comorbidities, is, I think is how they call it, uh -huh. where they have a heart condition or they are diabetic, yeah. and then they catch COVID, yeah. I think a lot of the deaths that are being recorded around the world, yeah. I, don't, I haven't paid attention to the statistics here, but a lot of the deaths that are being recorded now are being attributed to COVID when you know the major when it was actually the underlying uh, or at least the underlying mo comorbidities were probably the the the, 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 the bigger influence the, the in bigger influence in yeah. somebody to die yeah it is that's I, I i remember about this tweet and then people went in my dms and they were like oh this information the tweet was about like i wish there could be uh an a, an a transparency in terms of uh what kind of underlying issues mm -hmm. that the it's hard to know though someone it, comes to the hospital yeah, and they're sick yeah, and they're sick and, and uh, yeah maybe they have something that's undiagnosed but then you can say like maybe 40 percent were obese that's easy to see or we're pretty busy on the top we're yeah pretty busy trying to handle because all problem, those yeah. metrics get to be used after even you need them even yeah we the, have even if we win with the pandemic i mean you still need to know like uh because i still think at the end of the day, we're going to be, I mean, I was reading this article 
about how the Minister of Sports, uh, um, the Minister of uh, Health, was seeking for six hundred forty thousand, uh, six hundred forty million, if I'm not wrong, uh, to inject into the fight of um, non-communicable diseases uh-huh. like heart diseases and diabetes. That's what one Franks you're talking about. No, six hundred forty million dollars. Dollars. Uh, I think. I think. Six hundred forty million dollars. I don't know. Dollars, randoms. I don't know. Whatever it is, it was some some some, some figure like that. Six hundred forty million dollars would be sixty-four yeah. million U.S. Or but it's yeah. So, but it's 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 good. On. It's good that we yeah, that we are. But with with that number, maybe yeah. I mean, I could be wrong. I mm-hmm. don't even know the currency. A lot of money. Yeah. So it was a lot of money. A shitload of money. Then I was like, which is really really cool. Uh-huh. So what does it do if it goes into infrastructure? Are we talking about clinics or sports centers or? Uh, preventive healthcare, basically. Right. Preventative healthcare. Yeah. yeah. So um, then, um, because if we really spend that kind of money yeah. wisely, we can be more on the prevent or no on the yeah. Preventing and preventative anything healthcare to actually saves money in the end. Yes, because yeah, medical bills are not cheap. Yeah, as, people as you know people it. live and they're not in the hospital. Yeah. So then um, we're in a country that doesn't have. We're starting to adopt all kinds of Western. Uh, p- way of living that isn't even liked in Europe or in America anymore. Things like the culture of fast food. I mean, it's something that we consider. Yeah. Uh, yeah, not so good. Every you, one you, of you those. You and I had a slight disagreement over the <laughs> opening of KFC, <laughs> Kentucky Fried Chicken. I still KFC. haven't gone, by the uh, way. <laughs> I have not. Did you? Gone. Did you read? I also wrote a piece. Uh, wrote I a did. piece on that. I and did. Then, uh, yeah, it was. It was just funny. No, I feel like uh, no, we're not ready for that. I, I don't. Th- we have. We way, don't need it. We don't need it. And we yeah. We have enough chips and. We don't ready for that yeah. culture. Yeah, let's eat our potatoes and uh, beans and get yeah. them. Yeah, we have. Oh, we have no problem with eating cows, but yeah, so. Coming back, we, we coming back to prevent, we don't need fast food. Is the yeah. point? Yeah. Coming back to preventative healthcare, it's yeah. very important because I feel for everyone that for everyone, especially and, in 2021, where everyone's on phones and everyone, like you said before, yeah. everyone's got a car, everyone's got people it, don't have to move. If you have, if you have a certain amount, a budget, mm-hmm. and let's say you want to eradicate something like cancer, no, no, let's say obesity. Mm-hmm. Right, mm-hmm. the the most money, in my opinion, of course, if the if you have like a bigger, if you have a population of ten people mm-hmm. and eight are obese, mm-hmm. the most money goes to treating them, right? Goes to treatment because it shows the priority where the priority right. has to be. Yeah, but if you have two people mm-hmm. and then eight are okay, mm-hmm. the most money goes to preventing the eight from being a bit to being obese. Okay. Trying Does it make sense? Yeah, like basically the the numbers and the statistics uh, of how many. I mean, I'm seeing just how if how, you can forecast, how hard is the problem? Right. Yeah. Be, uh, at the end of the day, yeah. That that You're much money. You that still, that amount you of money. Still spend the money to keep people from being obese instead, instead of spending of curing it after. Yeah. Yeah. We can build fancy hospitals. But then that's w- what you basically. There's this spectrum I of got like you. of I like got you. yeah sick well but and, it's and a, fit it's a tough thing to, if, it's a tough if, thing to measure though if you yeah not really when you look because it's lifestyle i mean it's just a, if you ha- if it's you have a study to, over a span of time then you can measure it but it's kind of have you ever heard the analogy that like the dog that bark, barks at the mailman he mm, thinks no. he's he thinks he's keeping the mailman away he thinks uh-huh. he's preventing an attack yeah right and he mm-hmm. barks at the mailman every day for 10 years mm mm-hmm. As far as he knows, he's pre- he's successfully prevented an attack yeah. every day for ten years. Yeah, he has no idea that that mailman is not that a threat, <laughs> and he never will know. Yeah, right. Yeah, but in his reality, he was preventing something dangerous. Mm. He was protecting the home. Yeah, yeah, right. So, like when it comes to preventative health care, you're talking about, you know, if you've got a population of ten and you say, you know, eight out of those ten are obese, then obviously you have a problem. But you're saying is if eight out of those 10 are healthy and only two are obese, mm-hmm. that you need to forecast and think about those. What can I other, do so that those they don't people get are sick? Exactly, yeah. to save money in the future. Yeah. But that takes, you know, that takes forward thinking, that takes forecasting, and that's... 
Yeah, but so is. I mean, it's a done. tough decision. Yeah, yeah. Because on this, there's this thing, uh, uh, this continuum about uh, uh, seek well fit. Right. All those are industries. Right. And if you open a clinic, if you, you are in the business of sickness. Yeah. If you open a gym, you're in the business of fitness. In the business of health. In the business of health. Which is much, much cheaper than being sick. <laughs> than being sick. But that's, so, I think that's the so, problem is the money. So, yeah. There's a lot the of money. money. There's a lot of money. If you want to understand the problem, people. you follow the money. Yeah. 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 There's a lot of money to make in sick business. Yeah. And uh, than to make in uh, making people well. So that's where the problem. And, and, and of course, can, a, that's an a country problem. as an institution, yeah. uh, it's not spared in, yeah. in that kind of thinking. So yeah, we need we need that. We need people to think outside the box and we need yeah. I think it's an uphill battle and I think you just need to keep yeah. repeating yourself yeah. without making too many without enemies. Without making uh, too many enemies. And then, but you uh, want you gotta make some. Like that there's a there's a saying so, that I love which is piss off the right people. Yeah. <laughs> which is yeah. not easy. So basically what I do for me is to sit and then as it's most of what I say it should be common sense and it's nothing out of what people see on a daily basis i propose things that could be made into policies it should be common things sense like, but it's things like cock mm. is is cheap cheap yeah. in in the city but it's not cheap in rural area and if we really we were talking about how You're talking we, about we the, consume. Rel the relative cost the, yeah so we were talking about how um um how we fuel for action, how we right, should consider right, food right. as fuel. So it's expensive for someone in a rural area to become unhealthy, but someone in the city can it's get so unhealthy. It's so cheap yeah. in the city to be unhealthy, but in rural area, it's very, it's very expensive. Yeah. So, and I, I feel like there should be all kinds of incentives in place for people who are actually in the preventative healthcare there should business. Be. There, there should, should be. be yeah. but it could be like, eliminating taxes when you are importing let's say fitness equipment Something. and then people can invest more into community fitness because it's an area that doesn't have a lot of money but that's needed right and if the government doesn't really incentivize on that no one is gonna go because there's not a lot of money to make yeah. in there and it's, initiatives it, like uh, uh, like uh, what is it called no car Car free, car, car free. free day. Yeah, yeah, they are good, but then they car don't. free day for everyone is a day where they shut down the majority of the main thoroughfares in the city, from what is it like six a.m. to eleven, and uh, yeah, basically there's no traffic on those streets, and they, um, you know, one side is for people on foot, one side is for people on wheels, and you have everyone coming out to ride their bikes, run, yeah. rollerblade, and everything yeah. like that, and it's basically an initiative to get the city active. It's usually on the last Sunday of every month. It's right? actually bi monthly now. It like happens uh, twice a month. Yeah, twice a month. Twice month. a month. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's great. Yeah, and so, I've only participated a number of times because normally I like to go training a little bit later in the day. But it's 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 awesome. Yeah, it's a pretty cool initiative. Yeah, for the culture, mm -hmm. big 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 deal to plant that seed in people's heads. But yeah. if you have specific goals to achieve, mm -hmm. two times a month of training is not gonna cut it. So you need it plants a seed to, though. It does, yes, for like kids not to end up where their parents are. Yeah. But if we're talking about now repairing what's already broken, mm -hmm. you need more than two times a month of training. Yeah, I'm so, starting to see some fat. <laughs> I'm starting to see some fat kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, of course, it's something that is not uh, talked about a lot here. But we have some childhood obesity going on in schools. You see it. But it's kind of a new thing, almost. I mean, I'm sure in um, every culture you have a couple of people who are fat. But I mean, eating at school is new. I mean, all these things are coming with new practices. Yeah. You know, this so is the fun this is the interesting. <laughs> this is the every time. Uh, sorry, sorry. When, when we, we, I'm so interested. When I visit schools, for example, I was changing the school for my daughter, and and one of the things I was asking was like, show me your kitchen because I wanted to have a chat with somebody I will find there. How old, how old is she now? She's turning four. So she just started in school. Yeah. So, but it's so important for me to know what she's putting into her body. With you as a dad, she's going to go for the first fast food she can find <laughs> <laughs> to rebel. <laughs> Let's see. She's yeah. got good genes, though. She'll be fit. Yeah, she'll be fit, I I, I think, without a doubt. I mean, uh, also, what we try to do as parents is to just build a, a culture around around her. She sees us. She sees me going in the morning. She sees me most in my training gear yeah. than any other clothes. 
her mom is very active we're very lucky to just have this positive yeah uh, influence on her so I it's uh this I is such a this is, is a topic that we can delve really deep deeply into because yeah. there's there's layers of analysis that we can address and um you know obviously the first one that we've talked about already is just sort of like you know the 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 basic principles at work, hmm. but then we have to apply it to where we are. Yeah. Right. Which yep. is, which is sort of like, um, almost a complimentary conversation. Mm -hmm. And then you put them, put yeah. them together. But I would, the thing that I hear and the thing that I'm, I'm seeing is that, yeah, you're right. All this does make sense. Yeah. makes a lot of sense. It should yeah. make sense, but yeah. it is somehow also counterintuitive. In right. What sense? It, in the sense that it doesn't occur to people because it's invisible, right? When everything's mm -hmm. okay, yeah. you don't see the problem coming because it's not here yet, yeah. right? So you have yeah. to forecast. Now yeah. you as a fitness professional, you're very hyper aware of this mm. and you're at the leading edge of it because yeah. you're dealing with people that have problems and yeah. people that have big enough problems to yeah. do something about it, yeah. right? So you're, you're, the, you're, at, you're the tip of the spear on this issue, yeah. but in terms of making change in policy and as a culture, it's difficult to get anyone or any group, any population, any government, any organization to to take the initiative to prevent a problem that's coming in the future or to can be, can be convinced that that's where we're headed. Yeah, but you it, know? yeah. Because but, then what you have to do is you have to shift your priorities and be like, okay, we're gonna spend money on this thing that isn't in our faces yet. But which is impossible? It's possible. It's possible, yeah. but it takes courage. Courage. And clear thinking and the the culture we're talking about uh because i always like i don't know it, break things down to the individual level uh that's the ultimate metric uh yeah ultimately i mean it's the way you are that you um, that creates the perception you have on everything so yeah. get up move mm -hmm. so that if i come when you are actually suited up and we're talking about fitness because you pr you yourself moves yeah we probably are gonna be understanding each other right but if you don't at all if you are like because there's a lot of denial there's a lot of like right. in terms of like the help is here mm -hmm. there are things you could do mm -hmm. even during covid we've been uh, coming up with all kinds of content to help people freely right uh then but still the culture is not there enough for everyone to actually feel like there's a problem if I didn't move this week or there's a problem if I didn't do something today or right. there is no if if they don't see a problem if they just eat four or five meals without thinking about where they're going yeah and what's the impact they're going to have on their health so I feel like um, the more there are lots of um, my focus I feel now is to as I still fight advocating mm -hmm. for, for, for fitness to actually be affiliated to Ministry of Health more than, as opposed to where we are affiliated to now, which I is Ministry you, of Sports. I saw you tweet something where you just, you, you made a really good point. You're like, I think that, you know, I can't wait for the policy or what, whatever, you, whatever, however you worded it for fitness instructors and, you know, basic, basically people that do what I do that address mm. this issue to be essential businesses and yeah. essential workers yeah, yeah. allowed to operate during COVID yeah, yeah. within the guidelines. Yeah. You know, just like other things that are essential, it's like if you neglect your health during this time, it's going to get even worse. Yeah. I think that people's thinking is always just like, well, it's it's temporary, yeah. but it's been a year. And we need to start planning yeah. for this to go And I feel like this is a very uh, important window we have to have these kind of conversations because we are in a pandemic. Yeah. And it's more so, need, I mean, if you are in a good health right now, yeah. I, I, I guess one of those people, you, some of those people you see in bars and restaurants and uh, without a mask or not obeying all these restrictions, they probably have a thing in their head that tells them like, okay, I'm a, a bit young, I'm healthy, and I can beat this virus. Yeah, everybody so thinks that, that doesn't apply to them. <laughs> yeah. I'm so, a, but yeah, you it's, guys it's, do that. It's but a thing. I'm I good. mean, the health you have, yeah. the virus comes into your, bo into your body. I mean, you're, everybody at this point is like like i don't know if you can run if unless you stop living and then you go to a fucking island somewhere mm. but you you can contract covid anytime now yeah but then it's important and you might not even in know. what shape it finds you yeah and it's also important because i think i've heard a lot of studies that it has 
even if you survive it, even if you never knew you had it and you survive it, it can have some lasting impacts. Uh, impacts. Some yeah. stuff in the lungs and they don't yeah. they don't know what the long term effects of it are. Yeah. So this is a very important uh window to have this conversation about uh keeping our body healthy before we get sick because it's an it's it's a it's a very uh important it's time. urgent we got we it's urgent we got yeah. to be reminded by a pandemic yeah. that we need to keep our i think i think that's a good place to even though I mean, we, we, we could go on forever but i think it's yeah. a good place to wrap up on these two on two points i'm going to make yeah. a counterpoint i'm going to piggyback your point mm. this preventative health is really important we don't know how long our situation is going to go on like this. We don't mm-hmm. know how well the vaccine is going to work. Yeah. We don't know when we're going to go back to normal life or if we're going to go back to normal life. We don't know yeah. if another virus is going to come. Yeah. But this is a wake-up call yeah, it to is. how important fitness is and how important it is to move and how much attention we should place and how much money we should allocate towards these things of like, okay, how do we keep our population from dying? How do we keep our population out of the hospitals? Yeah. I'm going to piggyback that and I'm going to say that a temporary lockdown for a few weeks is fine suspending forts sports for a little while is fine yeah right the olympics got postponed that was crazy i don't know yeah, when the last yeah. time that, that happened was yeah but i'm gonna i'm gonna piggyback and say that sports are essential they are because I've, if yeah. we don't if people can't go out and play games safely but if people can't go out and play games if people yeah. can't race if people don't have no outlet if we don't have this form we're in trouble people are gonna go nuts they are Start, going nuts. Yeah. Not only there are plenty of professionals who do that, who make a living doing that, that yeah. of course won't have a living, yeah. but also people who are entertained by it are not going to get that entertainment. And imagine a world without sports. It's a scary We're going world. To be, it's, very, it's like a world without arts. It's not just that. <laughs> it's not just that. What Bunch we, of zombies. We will what be, we get to do in sport er, and in fitness is we get to sort of test our own limits and other people's limits and we get to figure out who we are. And without that format, you're going to have to turn to other things to figure out who you are. And you have a huge yeah. spike of mental illness. You have health in general deteriorating. And who knows what else? I mean, it's only been a year of this, but who knows how long it's going to go on. So we're, we're, we're facing down the throat of the beast. And I think yeah. we need to address this shit. Tell you what, next time, why don't we pick up? Why don't we chat about the phenomenon of what happened when uh, Rwanda, was it the eight finals that they made? The Ronda made it into the eighth finals of Chan football yeah, tournament, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, and yeah. and uh, the city went nuts. Yeah, we could let's discuss talk about, about that. Let's cool. let's start out next time talking about that because I think that that's a really interesting uh, thing that happened yeah. that can sort of give a, a a backdrop and sort of a reference point to some of these issues, and we can sort of go off in a few different directions and yeah. talk about what we can do and what specifically what we can do here. All right, bro. Thank you, man. Thanks for your time. Cool. Thanks. Next, we'll be, we'll be here again in a couple of weeks. Like a couple of weeks, two weeks maybe, man. You, yeah. you and I will probably be here next weekend, but we'll post it in a couple of weeks. Cool. All right, bro. Okay. Let's go.